to the April 9, 2018 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Town, excuse me, Town Council. May we please have the roll call? Chairman Sullivan here. Councilor Garvin here. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Councilor Penelope Jordan here. Councilor Lennon here. Councilor Randall here. And Councilor Straw here. May we pledge allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any town council reports and correspondence? Councilor Penny Jordan? Um, I'd just like to remind everybody about the comprehensive plan work that is going on and uh, as always there's a new question out on um, Loomis if people go out to the town website and select uh, comprehensive plan you should be able it should take you directly to the forum for discussion also out on the website at this point in time you will find the results of the um, survey and um, which I think you'll find some interesting results. And um, in June, we'll be doing another public forum. So uh, stay tuned for that date. Thank you. Councilor Straw? I've had uh, multiple inquiries from both dog owners and non-dog owners with respect to the new ordinance in Fort Williams and specifically when they could expect to have the fence up around the multipurpose field. Thank you. Councilor Carvin? Um, I'm pleased to report that the Spurwing School Reuse Committee submitted its report to the manager and chairman uh, a couple weeks ago, or a week and a half ago, and um, I know it's not on tonight's agenda. I uh, look forward to that being on the future agenda, but just wanted to let everybody know that that report had been completed and the work of that committee um, is pretty much wrapped up. Uh, I know we extended, again, the deadline at our most recent meeting, so I just wanted to report on that. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Okay. <clears throat> okay, next item is we have a report from the town assess assessor, uh, Clinton Sweat, relating to a draft senior citizen tax relief ordinance and program. And this is a uh, 2018 goal of the town council to explore the creation and implementation of a senior citizen property tax relief program. Great. So, thank you. Great. Uh, Thank you, Council, for, for having me here and for the public. Uh, I am Clinton Sweat. Um, when uh, the town leaders um, asked me to come up with a, a tax relief program, I thought to myself, there's, there's got to be other programs out there that I can either uh, cherry pick from or <laughs> find a plan that would work well for our town. And I needed to look no further than uh, our neighbors to the west, Scarborough. They have a, a really nice uh, senior tax relief program that I feel we can uh, possibly use and adapt to, uh, to use here if, if it goes forward. Um, and along with the PowerPoint, I did print out a bunch of documents on the back if anybody wants to grab one and follow along or take one as they, they leave, uh, feel free. Um, so, yes, basically um, the uh, Senior Tax Relief Program uh, is, a, is modeled after the Scarborough Program. And we're just going to do a, a high overview of the program. I'm not going to go bullet by bullet. Um, the basic framework is um, <coughs> the, the taxpayers would, would have to be 62 years of age or older. Uh, be a Cape Elizabeth resident for, for 10 years or longer. And there would also be a test for eligibility and that would be based on uh, income. And here again, all those items can be discussed and changed, tailor-made to, to whatever we want. Um, let's see, the, um, the, uh, the program is pretty easy. They simply come to the assessor and fill out an application. Uh, the assessor will review that based on the, um, the criteria and uh, that information will be confidential naturally. 
Um, the maximum benefit could be capped at $500 per household. Um, and then just kind of going over some of the Scarborough ordinance notes, um, they request that the uh, application be in by April, by uh, October 15th. That way we can do our budget preparing as we enter into the, the budget cycle in, in December. And it would be an annual filing, which means the applicant would have to reapply every year. And the reason for that is uh, their income status could change year over year. So every year they would have to uh, apply new for that. Um, the, uh, the tax assessor would process the applications, like I said. Um, the assessor's decision uh, shall be final. Uh, of course, all this can be, you know, if we want to have an appeal process, we can you know, work that out in committee if we wanted to. Um, let's see. Uh, that's just a, a sample uh, application. Uh, it's pretty easy to, to fill out and turn in. Now I wanted to uh, I wanted to kind of compare Cape Elizabeth to uh, Scarborough as far as uh, population. They're approximately twice the size of of Cape. Um, last year, Scarborough had a budget of uh, seventy five thousand dollars for the program. This year, it has ballooned up to two hundred thousand. So it's a a popular program. Um, Last year they had 312 participants. Uh, Cape Elizabeth, it'd probably be fair to estimate that we would have about 150 participants based on average age of, of property owners uh, that might qualify for that. Um, some of the decisions that, that we would have to make uh, would be the uh, income limits. You know, we could keep it at, uh, at 50,000 or move to the Cape Elizabeth medium household, median household income of uh, 59.7, which, you know, I pulled that off the census data. That's where I got that from. Um, you know, the benefit cap, do we want to keep it at 500? We could, you know, raise that or change it. Um, residency of 10 years, that could be changed, could be five years, whatever we want to do with that. You know, do the applicants uh, currently owe taxes? Um, you know, all these things are things that we need to decide. Um, if they're delinquent, instead of issuing a check to the, to the benefactor, would we be better off to apply that towards the outstanding taxes? Um, those are all things that we would have to take care of. And I know that was quick, but that's pretty much the program in a nutshell. Um, I'm more than happy to, to take questions. Thank you. Do councils have questions? Uh, Councilor Randall? Is this sample application modeled after Scarborough's? It is. I just copied it down from their website. And the 50,000, is that the Scarborough number? It is. Okay. Yep. Oh, I have one more question. No, okay. Yeah. Um, does Scarborough take into account assets or just income? I believe it's just income. And age. And age. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> Anyone else? Councilor Straw? Uh, is, does Scarborough take into account the valuation of the home? So, for example, if I have a $2 million home, can I still qualify for the program? Uh, I believe, yes. Um, yes, the. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, there are uh, limits. I believe it can only be up to 5% of your uh, taxable value to qualify. And presumably, we can explore all these various dials and knobs if exactly. we send it to workshop. Yep. Yes. Councilor Garvin. Thanks for being here. Thanks for doing the work on the presentation. Um, I'm really, really excited to see this. Um, going back to last year, uh, and I know that programs like this have been discussed before. I'm, I'm not sure the history of it in Cape Elizabeth, but I know many other towns around us have it, um, whether they be small towns, 
that are comparable in size to ours, or even Portland, I believe, has a program like this. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think in the two and a half years that I've been on the council, and, and even before that hearing in the community, sort of uh, the growing tension between the pressure on property taxes in a town that is almost exclusively, um, you know, from a revenue perspective, built upon prop property taxes. Um, you know, there's been an increasing pressure, obviously, on um, uh, those increasing tax rates, um, and, and uh, in, in some cases, that outpacing um, you know people's incomes. I think programs like this are a, a great idea um, to try and find a common ground um, for everybody. So I'm really excited to see this. The details, I think we can we can certainly finesse and nuance um, so that they make the most sense for this community. But um, I'm I'm highly supportive of this um, from a conceptual standpoint. So yeah. thank you very much. And I, and I hope to be in the loop as well. You know, if there are workshops or any subcommittees, be more than happy to, to sit on those and, and be a part of that, so. Councilor Penny Jordan. I'd just like to echo um, Jamie's comments and, um, and I know there's a lot of nuances that I could kind of throw out here tonight, but I don't think it's the appropriate forum. What is our, uh, what is our timeline for kind of moving ahead with this? Well, I'd like to get it on the next available workshop so that we can um, provide this relief awesome. to seniors as soon as possible. I'm not sure how fast that will be, but um, maybe the town manager can help us with that. If I may, through the chair. Mm -hmm. uh, I do have some familiarity with the, uh, the program that Clint was talking about as well uh, as the former assessor in Scarborough. And we did the rewrite when I was working there. So uh, the one thing that we, the council would need to consider would be to, we'd have to craft an ordinance and then put that into place. <clears throat> that being said, uh, the question also would be at what level would you like to place in the current budget for funding? Uh, mm -hmm. You could. My thought is you could probably fund it and then backfill the details on the ordinance part with an implementation to take place in the fall. Mm -hmm. When you could, at that point, you know, over the course of the summer, you could have that, have that come into place, be an existing ordinance, you know, enacted with a 30-day <coughs> live action after it was passed, and then in the fall you would be able to start processing. So if you wanted to fund that, looking at Mr. Sweat's uh, analysis of thinking $75,000 would be a good jumping off point. That would be uh, what you'd be looking at for targeted tax relief. So you'd, you'd place that in the current operating budget for that, that's, you know, that'll become live January, uh, July 1. So uh, I, I think you could implement it this year and okay. get people in play for the, you know, for processing in the fall and ready for. for so it would go to a workshop, then to meeting, then to ordinance committee? Possibly, I think you could either the ordinance committee or possibly uh, via the council. I mean, the, quite okay. honestly, there's a lot of plug and play here that uh, that you won't okay. have to reinvent the wheel on. It's uh, the, the, the Scarborough ordinance is is a very well written. I'm, okay. I'm not pumping my own tires. It, some really good people worked on it, uh, and it's a, it's a good piece. Councilor Strong. Uh, I wasn't going to bring them up. Um, figured I'd save them for the workshop, but if we're looking to do this on an expedited fashion, is it helpful if right now I iterate the knobs that I'd like to know what our options are? Or should I just could, save it? Could you repeat that? Sure. Um, there's a, a number of factors that we can change based on what our policy decisions are. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't going to go through them right now. I was going to save it for the workshop. But if we're trying to expedite this, I would bring them up just so Clinton has that menu of options available for us at the workshop. Well, um, if I think otherwise, if, I can wait. Yep, I, right. I think it would be best to wait. I think right. that um, we have the time to right. get something right. crafted prior to the first tax bill in the fall. I, I had myself envisioned a workshop so that we could discuss what the parameters might be. Then send a request to the ordinance committee mm -hmm. to right. craft an ordinance. Then it would come back to the council for more discussion and approval. But that's what I was thinking. Right. Everybody okay with that? All right, any more questions for Clinton? No? Yeah, Thank you. Oh. Yeah, Chris, another thing I could do for you is, um, you know, as soon as I can, I'll try to come up with some examples of, you know, if, if we refund, you know, X number of dollars, the impact will be this. I'll try to come up with, with some, some things that, that you can uh, process. Okay. Thanks. All right. 
Thank you very much. Great. Thank you all. Thanks, Minister. And also thank you to Councilor Garvin for keeping this on the forefront. So thank you very much. Is there anyone from the public that would like to comment on this? Yes. Take your spot. <laughs> Hi, I'm Suzanne Mazel Hubs. I'm from um, 18 Belfield Road, and I want to commend the town council for placing this draft, this draft of the senior citizens tax relief ordinance on tonight's agenda. I know it's not the first time, but I think it's the perfect time to seriously consider and implement this type of ordinance. The steady decrease of state funding, particularly for our schools, is currently at a historic low and not likely to improve anytime soon. And yet, the expectation that Cape Elizabeth will continue to provide a highly successful and reputable public education has not decreased. The community expects and depends on our schools to remain at the top in the state and nationally on many standards. This is part of the reason our property evaluations are so strong and the reason why year after year this community votes in favor of the school budget. However, tax implications are currently at the mercy of state funding. There needs to be a mechanism in place that can provide relief in local taxes for community members who need it most. The state of Maine recognizes this and has implemented a property fairness credit for citizens. However, this alone does not help most of the people in Cape Elizabeth who want to continue to see their properties increase in value, yet find it challenging to keep up with rising property taxes. As a result, local governments are allowed to create their own additional tax relief system. For example, by creating a circuit breaker whereby certain fixed income community members are not asked to pay taxes above a certain percentage of their annual income. This is fair and reasonable as it allows our community to stay intact, stay in place and work together. We are all stronger and healthier when we work together and take care of each other. I highly encourage you to consider this as quickly as you can. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak to this item? All right. Moving on. <clears throat> Could we please have the Finance Committee report and the dashboard? Councillor Garvin? Just a second. When you're ready. <laughs> I guess I jumped into that kind of Sorry fast. <laughs> Um, so a few things on the Finance Committee side. Um, we're obviously getting into the, the sort of busy season. Um, I want to let the public know of upcoming workshops um, uh, both this week uh, on Thursday. We'll be having uh, sort of a preliminary workshop uh, with the school board um, to discuss some of the uh, implications around the school budget for this year, um, followed by our normal um, cooperative workshops with them uh, coming up on the 26th and 27th or 24 24th and 5th. 24th and 25th, sorry. Um, so those meetings are all open to the public um, and uh, um, everybody is encouraged to attend and, and voice their opinion on that. Um, I, I would take a moment to underscore um, a request for public input this year. Um, I think that uh, more so than in any year that I've been a part of the council, um, this is proving to be a challenging budget year. And I think it's really, really important that we hear voices from everybody in the community about um, you know, what their feelings are, um, what their priorities are. Um, we have an open process for a reason. It's to hear from you all and to um, make sure that uh, the community is well represented in the decisions that we make. And so um, I'm, I'm really, you know, frankly, um, you know, desperate to hear from people uh, as we go through this process leading up to our May decision on, um, on, on ultimately voting on the budget. So, um, so that's that. Um, the financial dashboard is included in the packet. Um, Matt, I'll turn it over to you to see if there's anything that you wanted to highlight. There was nothing significant that I saw, um, you know, differing from recent month's reports, but by all means. Thank you, thank you, Councilor yep. Garvin. I'd be happy to. Uh, I do have a couple of items that I'd like to uh, focus on. As you've heard uh, us report or heard me report a couple different times over the past year uh, about our tracking of our cable, cable franchise fee that uh, 
Last year, we, we received approximately $10,000 less than we were anticipating, and that was due to them miscalculating the amount that they were to pay the town uh, over the course, I guess, of, uh, of about eight months worth of doggedly pursuing them and asking them to check their numbers. Uh, they found that they had made an error in their calculation, and they rectified that error uh, about two weeks ago with uh, to the tune of an additional $25,000 in revenue this year. So. Uh, worked out pretty good for the town, uh, I would say. I like. I, I guess it was a good expense to make a few phone calls and emails on that side. Uh, so we received one hundred seventy-five thousand eight hundred and twenty-six dollars from uh, Charter Communications, who is now the, who was originally Time Warner, who we had, uh, where we were, we were anticipating one hundred and fifty. So they made up for last year's shortfall in, in additional some additional funds. So that's on, that's on the good news side. Uh, on the bad news side, the only area that I have uh, concern about and we'll be uh, coming back to the council next month on is on our legal services line item uh, where we are uh, going to spend more than we anticipated last year due to some unforeseen lawsuits that have come our way. So I'll be coming back to the council next month with uh, a request to adjust the funding in that on that area. Uh, I know and if you're, if you're reading the Press Herald or local news uh, about three weeks ago, you were finding that many of the other communities surrounding us were in dire straits with their salt and sand budgets, and I want people to know that we are in fine shape with our salt and sand budgets, especially with this weather turning. So uh, and we are encouraged by that, and we are not reusing the sand that is being swept up, though. Uh, so, But our salt budget, we're still well within our tolerances where we need to be. and. Uh, we're grateful for our public works director for making an accurate representation where we need it to be. So we're in good shape on that side. Uh, and that's, that's where we're at as far as from the dashboard. <clears throat> um, the last couple of things I'll note, uh, in a moment we'll review and, and approve uh, or vote on the minutes. Uh, we held um, finance committee workshops on the 20th and 21st of March to review um, the initial budget projections um, and requests. Uh, with all the department heads and with the manager. Um, all of those materials are available online. Uh, and again, the, the, the minutes of those meetings uh, are included in, in this packet as well. So um, that's all I have to report from the Finance Committee. Yeah. All right, thank you. Can I add one? Oh, yes, sure. Um, I just noticed today on the website that this Wednesday, the 11th, the school board, I'm just picking up on what Jamie said about wanting to, so much to hear from citizens. The school board is going to hold two public forums um, this coming Wednesday right here in the town hall. One is from 9 to 10 in the morning and one's from 6 to 7 at night. And the express purpose of this is for them to listen to people, take questions, and explain things that people don't know or understand. So I think that this is a really great opportunity um, for citizens to come and weigh in and, as importantly, to get answers to your questions. I know it's an incredibly complicated process and difficult to understand. So that's an opportunity for all of us to hear more. Thank you. Is there anything else uh, uh, pertaining to the financial dashboard and report? All right. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, if uh, we could have <clears throat> an update by the town manager on the capital improvement plan. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'd be happy to do that. Uh, as you know, this is our, our budget season. We did review uh, a, a couple of weeks ago with the council our current uh, forecast expenditures for the capital uh, capital projects that we have lined up for next year. Uh, I'd just like to report on three items in particular that we're looking at that are our large ticket items that we have on this year's capital plan, and that is our full-size dump truck replacement slash plow truck replacement, uh, our ambulance replacement, and the ladder truck replacement that we have lined up for this year. Uh, I've been currently in the process of meeting with different lending institutions to find uh, the best possible deal that we can. Uh, and I'm, I'll be coming back with a recommendation on that, I believe, at the May, at the May meeting, at least uh, with some of the more findings. Uh, we are looking at a favorable financing uh, situation right now when it comes to that. Uh, I've spoken with three different banks as well as the main bond bank to see about what we can find for the best, uh, best deal for the town. Uh, by doing that lease purchase or uh, bonding for those items which are long lived, we're looking at a five year term at reasonable rates uh, and the estimated life of those is far in excess of the years that we have there. Uh, but coming and looking at our overall capital plan planning, uh, we are coming up on the fifth year of the last update of the capital improvement uh, strategy for the town. So uh, we'll, I'll be reviewing that over the course of the summer and trying to uh, 
prepare for the next five year uh, stretch. We do go out an extensive, we do have a 15 year capital stewardship plan that we currently have, but every five years or so, it's good to update that, revise, see where we're at, uh, check and adjust to see uh, what, what we need to find for our needs that may have been anticipated and others that are unanticipated. So we'll be looking at doing an update on that uh, operationally wide uh, over the course of the summer to be ready for next year's budget process. And so that's, that's where we're at at the present time. But I, we are, I, I am encouraged by the good news of uh, what we are looking at for, our, for accessing those or for purchasing those, those three large ticket items. So we are in good shape for that. Any uh, questions for the town manager? Um, <clears throat> I'd, I'd just like to uh, uh, commend you, Matt, for researching that because that's going to come in as significant savings to us all. So thank you you're, for you're those there. efforts. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, are there any uh, questions or uh, comments about the uh, finance documents, or appropriation control, expense distribution, revenue control, revenue distribution? Any Anything on those? Well, all right, thank you. Moving on. Now we have come to the time for an opportunity for a citizen to uh, discuss to the town or report to the town council or uh, concern of an item that is not on this evening's agenda. I believe we might have a citizen who would like to do that. Is there anyone here who would like to do that? Would you please come to the, the podium? And we will need your name and address. Hi. Um, my name is Janet Biliotti. I live at 7 Montgomery Terrace. Um, good evening to you all. Um, I'm here speaking tonight, uh, given some of this information that's been shared. As a concerned parent, a citizen, and a taxpayer, I have to say that Cape Elizabeth schools have an amazing tradition of excellence. I think our teachers do a great job. They're smart, they're passionate, they're innovative, and they're engaged. Our students are challenged, and they are supported. However, in my efforts to learn more about the school system, the budget process, and how it has been handling our tax dollars, I have discovered some very worrisome things about the district's financial accountability and overall transparency. Among these issues are a review of the 2018-19 Budget Appropriation Master Report revealed that as of early February, Pond Cove and the middle school administrations had already overspent by approximately $35,000 each, their current fiscal year allocation. Documents obtained after a freedom of access request confirmed that during fiscal year 17-18, the departing middle school and Pond Cove principals together received almost a quarter million dollars in settlements. Principal Eismeyer, after 17 years, received $30,000. The town's 2017 municipal audit noted, for the first time ever, significant deficiencies. These were largely due to school department bookkeeping issues. Approximately $4 million of commingled funds were identified. We are also experiencing tremendous school department administrative turnover. Within the last six years, we have had a total of 22 administrators come and go. On a related note, the school board held 31 executive sessions in 2017 alone, nearly all of them citing personnel issues as a rationale. In contrast, the Falmouth, Yarmouth, and SAD 51 school boards held only two or three. <clears throat> the school department website is extremely difficult to navigate, creating a barrier to access and in some places people are being asked to sign in with their email addresses, which is a violation of the public's right to know. I conclude by saying that I think ours is a great school system, and I'm sure I'm not alone when I say that I'd like to see it continue, but I am really worried about the sustainability of CAPE's tradition of great schools if this is the way business has been conducted. If I didn't care about our schools, I wouldn't be standing here tonight. I am not anti-teacher, anti-school budget, or anti-union, but I think a reckoning of what has been done with our tax dollars is overdue. To that end, I am requesting that the town council hold public meetings with the school board to demand answers, accountability, and corrective action plans. Thank you. Thank you. Can I pose a question to Ms. Villani? Yes. Would you mind answering a question from a counselor? Councilor Garvin? I just, 
if yes, you would please. Mind. Yes, please. <clears throat> so that everyone can hear your response. First, I wanted to thank you for your dogged research and all of the information you provided. I can only imagine that that took quite a bit of time. Um, so thank you very much for the you're, clear way that all welcome. that was spelled out. The one specific thing I had a question about, though, in the in the materials that you provided to us, um, the settlement agreements with principal ha former Principal Hassan and former Principal Tracy mm -hmm. seemed quite clear. Um, the one for former Principal Eismeyer, to me, appeared to have been a contract for services, not a settlement agreement. So it looked like he was additionally employed from July of 2012 to the end of September, and that the $30,000 payment was not for settlement of his 17 years of service, but instead for additional employment. Well, he was, I believe that he was kept on in a sort of consulting and transitional role, and mm -hmm. so perhaps that would be, that would account for the $30,000. It was included when I registered my FOA request. I requested all information going back the last six years pertaining to all administrators who had left and whether there was any severance or settlement paid out of any kind, um, whether it was in kind, tuition, um, anything, and that was what I was provided by the business office. So I understand that it says that it's a contract and my, what my request specifically was was for settlement. So it may have been a miscommunication with the people who provided me with the documentation. So the amounts of, of settlement with the with the other two principles is of concern to me, but I think it, it, it leaves people with the wrong and, and pr I, I think incorrect impression okay. to compare sure. payment made to them mm -hmm. for leaving mm -hmm. with, uh, especially the way it's worded, Principal Eismeyer, after 17 years, only it, 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 it seems to, the implication is that you're diminishing the amount paid to him for what I presume was was an understanding of the same type of payment, and I think they're for two totally different things. Is well, I'm yeah. the as you know, personnel the, the exact nature and what happens in yeah. personnel discussion is confidential. Yeah. So whether that was technically for services rendered or if it was sort of um, throwing someone the proverbial bone as they're retiring, I, I we I don't think we'll ever truly know the answer to that, Jamie. But that was what was provided to me, and I think that it is, um, you know. It may, it may well be a bit of a comparison, if a not fully accurate one. So I didn't intend to mislead anyone, but I felt that it was interesting to include. Um, my main concern was with the payments made to Principal Tracy and Principal Hassan, because especially in this budget season, we're basically double paying for two principals at our three schools this year. Thanks. You're welcome. Does anyone have any other questions? Uh, I, yes, would you like to speak? Yes, please. Thank you. Your name and address, please. My name is Sonia Medina. Oops, I live in Portland. Um, I've been a teacher for French and Spanish at the high school since 1995. And the comments I'm about to make represent my point of view only. It is my observation that over the years, the school board has operated in a very fiscally responsible manner, even though the state's contribution has continued to decline year over year. This year is particularly challenging. The continued loss of state funds, the required facility improvements, are putting in jeopardy the quality of the programs we offer. It is also my understanding that when the state was requiring schools to consolidate, the Cape Elizabeth was exempt due to the fact that it is fiscally responsible and conservative. In addition, in the recent years, the school board has made great effort, efforts to rebuild the trust that in the past, under a different superintendent, we had lost. I had the honor to participate in the superintendent search committee this school year, and I am very appreciative and grateful of the fact that the school board included teachers and community members throughout the entire process. Everyone's voice was heard. Everyone's concerns were discussed. Finally, in attending the last four budget workshops, I heard many times the board express concerns about the difficulties this year's budget presents to its community, to the school staff, and to our students. 
I believe it is important to, uh, to maintain the integrity of the programs we offer so we can challenge our students while meeting their needs and help them be healthy and successful. I have trust in the school board to make the right decision because they are willing to listen to the school staff and the community. In the end, our primary and only goal is to offer the best education possible to our students. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have, would, oh, yes, you'd like to speak to something not on tonight's agenda? Great. Yep, if you could come to the microphone and give us your name and address, please. Hi, I am Terry Patterson. I live at 15 Surf Road. So thanks for hearing me tonight. Um, I have two kids in the schools, one in middle school, one in high school, two boys. Um, collectively, I think about 18 years of parenting a Cape Elizabeth School student. Um, those 18 years have been overall pretty amazing. I think the education my kids are getting is pretty awesome. Um, I am here tonight to say that I've been involved with lots of committees in town. I've been in lots of committees in the schools. I've been involved with committees with sports. I've been in, involved with committees in my neighborhood. I've seen some of you at the Fort Williams committee meetings. I have a pretty good sense how things work in this town and I feel heard. I feel heard in all of those venues where I have a voice. Um, I also had the privilege of serving on a search for a school administrator a few years ago as a parent representative. Um, I'm gonna echo what Sonia Medina said in that I think all voices were heard. It was a very open, transparent process. I also would like to say that I was kind of dumbstruck and awed by the fact, by the amount and quality of the, um, the folks applying for the job. I thought the level would be higher. I think it's very hard. I think it's very hard to find a strong administrator that is up for the job, that is a right fit. Um, and, and that can handle the job. So I think we, elect, well, we found a good one and the person was hired, but it's a tough process. And until I sat through that committee and saw the work that happened, it's very difficult. Um, I'm here because I received a memo that was forwarded to me from Janet. Um, I know Janet from town, I like Janet. I think of her as very thoughtful and smart and committed. Um, I'm here to say thank you to Janet in a lot of ways, again, to echo what Jamie said for the dogged research. I think she did, um, it was a tireless effort to pull together and do the homework that she's done. Um, and I think that the town needs more people like Janet to stay committed, to stay involved, um, especially now. I've been to several of the school board meetings recently or um, council workshop meetings. It's, it's a tough budget year. Um, I certainly agree with that and I think that what Sarah said is true. We need everyone to step up to the microphone and use their voice because it's an important one. Um, my response to the memo, while I'm grateful for the work that was done, is a little different. Um, I know everyone, at least all of you all have read it. Um, I think that the facts are facts and I'm appreciative to have seen it all in one place. I hadn't, I'll admit, admittedly wasn't as familiar with them. Um, and facts are facts. I think that the facts paint a partial picture. I think the facts don't tell the full story. I think the full story is not the audit. I think the full story is not the 31 executive to meetings. I think the full story is what's happening in our schools and I have 18 years of experience there. Many people in the room with far more than that. I think that it makes assumptions. The memo makes several assumptions about the climate at our school and about the experiences that our kids are getting. Um, over the past few years, five, I'd say I'll admit that I had some serious problems in one of the schools. I thought the administration was poor. Mrs. Patterson, we have a three minute limit for all people, so if you could please wrap up your comments. Where am I? Am I, am I done? Beyond three minutes, but if you could just wrap up I will. your comments. I will. Um, I thought the tone of the mem mem memo was harsh and somewhat insulting. It was aggressive and it was accusatory. I encourage everyone to get involved in meetings, if, and I think we should all understand that a lot happens behind the scenes that doesn't even happen in the meetings. Um, I know that change is hard. I think progressive change is even harder, and I encourage us all to do it. I want to thank the council. I want to thank the school board for their work, the civility, and the open transparency and dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other citizens that would like to address the council on items not on tonight's agenda? 
Okay, seeing none, I, I do have a couple comments, uh, but are there any councils that would like to make any comments uh, before I finish up this, this part of our agenda? Anyone wishing to say anything, Councilors, Council Lennon? Well, I would just encourage this conversation to happen in front of the school board um, and the school administrators because it's really not our purview to get into the details of um, school administration, let alone personnel matters or hiring and firing or what packages people had or salary or anything else. In fact, we're prohibited by charter to do so. so Although we do choose the final number, and as Jamie said, we're all really looking forward to people's views on that. I, I, I'm, I'm feeling this is inappropriate for us to be hearing this. I think this is all great feedback that should be go to the school board. And as I mentioned, on Wednesday, there's two opportunities to do that. On Thursday, we have a workshop at night with the school board and so forth and whatnot. So um, yeah, it's thank you. And I think we should move on. And I think the conversation should happen largely with school board and school administration. So it's not a back and forth. I'm just, it's our turn to talk. And that's my comment. And I, I look forward to hearing more from you on Thursday. Well, it, it, it's not me. a conversation. You already spoke your three minutes. Sorry. But it, it, that's what the council does all the time, because if we get into this back and forth, we're then an hour into it, and the comment period's 15 minutes. It's very structured by rules, unfortunately. It, it's, I, that's I, how I, I feel. I think this conversation be, should be in front of the school board, not Thank the you. council. Thank you, Council Lennon. That's my feeling. And I would encourage you to do it again. Uh, excuse me. Uh, we, first of all, we are almost at 15 minutes. So I'd like to be cognizant of that. If we go beyond that, I would need a council vote to continue this conversation. We have a long agenda and many other things to consider. If you would like to come to the podium. She already used her three minutes. I just want to clarify one thing. The school board reports to the council. Well, in very limited ways. So I, I'd like to, I'd like to proceed on this evening. I have something to say about this. If, if every other counselor is ready to move on, I'll go ahead and say what I'd like to say. Um, we did receive, uh, just so people at home and those of you in the audience today, uh, we did receive a digital packet, packet from Ms., Mrs. Vigliotti um, yesterday. So I, I mean, I've certainly read it. I assume everyone has. Um, so first of all, those documents have been received by the town for the record. I'd like to thank her for her memorandum, which was obviously painstakingly researched and referenced by, from both the town's website and the school board's website. Transparency in government process and ease of access to information is critical to the public's right to know. And much of what was presented here in this digital packet involves transparency issues. Every citizen has a right to be informed. The town council is the ultimate governing body. We have been asked for action and we are bound to respond. Even if council action had not been requested, it would be incumbent upon us to respond to documents with this level of detail. Not all of the concerns are within the council's direct purview. However, the overriding concerns about transparency in government process are something that every elected official should want to address promptly and thoroughly. I'm sure that the school board will want a chance to address the concerns that Mrs. Bilotti has expressed. So I'd like to ask the town manager to reach out to the superintendent and the school board to convene a joint workshop with the town council. That meeting will be public, of course. As soon as we can find a date, we will post that information on the town's website meetings calendar. So thank you. So moving on, the next item is the town manager's monthly report. Thank you, Madam Chairman, happy to report. Uh, this past month was consistently busy as the municipal budget process continues. The municipal budget was delivered to the town council and then reviewed with each department within the finance committee. In pursuit of the best financing options, as I noted earlier, I've been in discussions on trying to find uh, the best financing package for the town. Uh, and in the follow up, uh, so I've already touched on that part, so I'll I'll move by that. Uh, in a follow-up of last month's approval to move the food vending sites at Fort Williams, 
Uh, we, three of the four vendors have committed to their locations in Fort Williams by providing deposits for the upcoming season and have all expressed their enthusiasm for, for going forward. Uh, speaking of Fort Williams, repairs at the fencing at Fort Williams as a result of last fall's windstorm uh, are underway. And there's also work on the retaining wall, which should be starting shortly at, at Battery Blair. So uh, we should see those projects underway shortly. As you've noticed, our sweeper is out there uh, running, running amok. Uh, in, as our public works department has been encouraged by the anticipated spring weather. And they are, quite frankly, working on the main, the main thoroughfares first and then transitioning to the secondary roadways. So they should be coming uh, by, by many folks in a short, short period of time if this weather holds. Another item to note is that the Parks Department is currently accepting applications for seasonal workers. So uh, if you have a young college student or uh, even a, a, an older high school student who may be encouraged or like that type of work, uh, please, uh, we would encourage them to, to look. It's a tough hiring environment and people with that type of aptitude, it's a great job to do for the summer. Uh, discussions are ongoing with both the Public Works and Police Collective Bargaining Units. And then finally, uh, I'd like to just update the Council to let you know that our, our departments, and as well as myself, have all been involved with our legal team in trying to assemble uh, and prepare all the documents and answering questions as part of the discovery process related to the uh, Surfside Avenue Paper Streets lawsuits. So uh, we've been spending quite a bit of our uh, staff time on pulling all that information together and our town's attorneys are currently working on assembling all that information requested and preparing it for delivery within the, statu uh, within the required time limits. And as we receive more updates, I'll, I will provide them. I did receive a request uh, from a citizen to, uh, to post uh, the, I guess you call it the, the legal filings as they, as they get filed onto the town's website. So uh, right now we have the current initial complaints posted on the website and we'll, as I have the town's responses, we'll also be putting that there and trying to assemble that for, <coughs> as there is a heightened, a high level of interest within the citizenry to, uh, to have that information. So we'll get that on the website as soon as we can so folks can have a chance to look at that as they'd like. So that is the manager's report, respectfully submitted. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for the town manager about his report? Okay, moving on. <clears throat> we have some draft minutes to approve. Uh, uh, I would like to entertain a motion to approve the draft minutes of March 12, 2018. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion or uh, edits for those draft minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor? They're approved. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to entertain a motion of, uh, to accept the draft minutes of special meetings held. Uh, we could do these together, I think, March 20 and March 21. Is there a motion? Council Garvin? Is there a second? second. Council Lennon? Oh, sorry. Sarah beat it to, <laughs> beat it, to it. <laughs> Councilor Lennon, any, any uh, edits or questions? All those in favor? Okay, they're, it's unanimous, they're approved. Okay, uh, the next item, number 56, uh, is the uh, uh, application of the Well LLC Qualified Catering. Uh, Councilor Penny Jordan. I need to recuse myself from this item. Because? It's because there's a business relationship with the establishment. Great, thank you. So you may, you may step down. Is there anyone who would like to speak to this item? Seeing no one. Yes. Councilor Kayla Jordan. I just want to disclose that my family does business with the well, but not to the extent that Penny Jordan has a business relationship with the well. We sell a few lobsters throughout the summer. Okay. Does any council have any concerns about Councilor Caitlin Jordan's business relationship with the well? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that disclosure. Um, okay. Um, if the town manager could proceed with that uh, application. I'd be happy to, Madam Chair. Uh, this is an annual renewal. Last year was the first year for the for the well to be uh, the well at Jordan's Farm to uh, to to get this qualified catering uh, license. Uh, so what this is ultimately is is a is a is a license to allow them to cater with liquor on and off presence. And so this is an annual renewal. Uh, 
oftentimes the question arises, have there been any, uh, any violations or any concerns related to this? And there are none that have been raised by the police, the fire department, or code enforcement officer. So uh, there's, there, there seems to be no obstacles in the way for, for moving this forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there a motion to approve the Well LLC Qualified Caterings application? Councilor Garvin. I move that we approve the application as presented. Is there a second? Councilor Lennon. Are there any questions or any discussion? All those in favor? It's 6-0. Thank you. The next item, number 57, review and discussion fiscal year 2017 audit results. Is there anyone that will, in the audience that would like to speak to this item? Seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, our, uh, one of the auditors that was going to be here with us tonight is ill. So uh, what I would entertain is uh, consideration of moving this to the May, May town council meeting. Um, as actually was mentioned earlier this evening, we did have uh, significant deficiencies on our municipal audit report for the first time in Cape Elizabeth history. These were the result of school department accounting issues. Um, we have taken correction action, corrective action already, and there are going to be more remediation actions, which the auditor was going to uh, inform us about, but we will have to wait until May for that. So we'll move on. Yes, Councilor Straw. Uh, um, I guess I was just curious. So my recollection was that the, uh, maybe you have a different view than I did. The big one that jumped out at me that I was most concerned about, it sounded like from the explanation, ultimately arose from a software an error in the software package we use is, I'm just curious, is there something in particular that we were looking to focus on in the discussion? The focus is to hear from the auditor what the corrective actions have, have ah, taken place. Since, since it was identified. Yes. Got it, got it, For, great. You know, we are, we are bound to report the situation to our community. We are bound to let them know what has, what correct, corrective action has taken place and what is planned. Got it. So that was the focus and the purpose of this item. So what we'll do is we'll revisit that in May when hopefully she's recovered from the flu. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so we're, we won't be dealing with this item. Uh, Council Lennon. Do you need a motion to put that next month or can we just keep going? Should we move? If, if uh, I may, let me ask the town manager. If, if I may, thank, thank you, Madam Chairman. I, I think if you take no action, we can carry this forward to next, to okay, next month. All right, thank you. Any, Council Garvin. Beyond the school issue, there was also a problem at Fort Williams, correct? It wasn't just a school? Well, the significant deficiencies, which were two, were school department accounting issues. We do have some issues with the gift house, uh, the gift shop at Portland Headlight, but they had not risen to the level of significant deficiencies. This is all on page two in the government auditing standards book. So, all right. So moving on to item number 58, pay display at Fort Williams Park. Uh, we did uh, discuss this um, at a fe February 5 workshop. We asked, with, with the Fort Williams Park Advisory Committee, we asked the uh, town manager to do some research. And uh, so I'd like to uh, tee it up for Matt a little bit and let him tell us what he has found. I, I envision a workshop on this, but you could please continue with this, Matt. Sure, sure, I'd be happy to, Madam Chairman. Uh, a couple of things have taken place since, since the February 5th meeting uh, that, that uh, was held with the Park Committee and, and the Council, as well as uh, this, in that, between now and then, we also, uh, the Council also had a workshop with the Fort Williams Foundation as well uh, to talk about some other you know, similar related uh, park issues. Uh, during that time period, uh, since then, I've had the opportunity to speak with uh, Chief Williams and myself, met with uh, a parking vendor uh, to see about uh, like what the anticipated cost and potential challenges for installation of pay display uh, parking uh, meters would be to be placed in the park. Uh, that was a very fruitful discussion, quite frankly. Uh, some of the challenges we were concerned about were uh, many of these are operated off from a cell, uh, cell cellular powered uh, interaction uh, with the internet to, to process payments. Meeting with the vendor, there are ways to work around that that they have with signal boosters and other, other uh, technology that they, that they look at. I also had the opportunity to speak with uh, other communities that have 
recently installed that uh, as, as recently as today, speaking with the manager in the town of York, uh, who has, if you saw in the paper, one time they had a little challenge last summer on the initial installation, and it was related specifically uh, to cellular interaction. Uh, so they weren't getting a lot of their, their um, I guess you'd call their, their, their sales registering accurately. So they had some challenges there. Uh, I'm going to be getting their, uh, the request for proposals that York used, uh, as well as other communities to, to try to uh, craft that if the council so chooses to go in that direction, uh, at least to find out what, uh, A, what type of uh, coverage we would need, uh, what we're anticipating after meeting with uh, the chief as well as Bob Malley uh, and Kathy Raftis, myself, and the vendor uh, from one of the one of the companies is that we're probably looking at seven or eight different uh, units to be placed in there. And there are different methods that one can do. There's a pay by plate uh, me mechanism that a folk that a person can use, uh, which has like a scanner. A person would enter in there what their license plate number would be on the machine, and then as a person could drive by and process all the cars, and if they found that somebody hadn't paid, and they, if, say for instance, didn't have a season pass on their automobile, uh, that, that then they would you know, ticket them, for lack of a better term. Uh, there's other ways you can do with the pay display, whereas you know, if you're on Commercial Street in Portland, you can you know, buy the ticket, put it on your dashboard, and that, that takes a little bit more uh, legwork, if you will, as far as having to go and take a look at you know, who's, who's permitted and who isn't or who might be over time. Uh, and uh, so that was another way, the way they looked at it. And then the third way, a third mechanism was uh, like a combination of that where you do a, a pay display or pay by plate, but then also with like a, a web enabled application on your, cell, on your smartphone where you could still like refresh it. Uh, they have that in Boston. Uh, so, uh, so there's different ways you can, you can refresh that instead of having to, you know, as, you know, the classic run back and feed the meter. Uh, you can do that, they can do that right from their smartphone. So there are different ways that, and, and of course, one is a little bit more expensive than the other, so, uh, uh, and there's different ways you can look at it where you could have split screens where you could process, uh, process different ways. You could do the, you know, the pay display or pay by plate, both as an option for a person. So uh, that's some of the things that would be, that would be fleshed out. Uh, and then the other area that we uh, were looking at was who would actually have to pay uh, and that um, I did have some conversations with uh, Doug Beck, who works uh, for the I think it's the Bureau of Parks and Lands at the state. Uh, don't kill me if that's if I've got the wrong department though. But uh, but he's the gentleman who's in charge of many of the grants that have been placed either uh, from the state side or uh, he's also knowledgeable of some federal grants that have been employed at the park uh, because we have been the recipient of grants grant funding at Fort Williams. Uh, we cannot exempt anybody from being able to pay. That being said, residents, you know, if, if you were looking to charge residents, you could charge them at a much lower level uh, where you could say, you know, provide a season's pass for a few dollars or uh, I know Councilor Strawn has talked about this many times. This would be a really good opportunity for us to engage uh, the transfer station stickers as a dual citizenship type of approach. So uh, that might get us better, uh, better participation on the transfer station sticker front, as well as uh, allowing people a mechanism where they can, they won't be, be having the problem of a ticket at Fort Williams for being there and being a resident. So uh, that being said, there are a number of questions that still have to, be, have to be asked and answered before we get to that point or before the town gets to that point. Uh, but this is uh, where we're at at this, at, at this level. Great, thank you. Um, can I ask a question? Public comment. Uh, um, yes, go ahead. I just want to ask, ask my question. question. So um, part of the work on the comp plan is getting, lining up people's highest priorities. And basically everywhere we go, the first thing people say is we want cell coverage all over town. So my question is, can you project if the Ford had perfect cell coverage, does that change the equation? Um, and in what ways? Because I would hate to say, oh, there's not good cell coverage, therefore we need to go with A, which requires a lot of personnel to be paid, right? So we're doubling up on, on costs. And then, you know, we start putting the comp plan in place and pretty soon we have perfect cell coverage and we didn't need that. So it's like three-dimensional chess. Yeah. If this, then that. So can, when we have our workshop, can you also show us, assuming that, that Ford had great cell coverage, what are, what are our possibilities for something to be much more electronic or, or phone-based? Okay. Uh, 
Interest, that's, that's a great question, Council. And uh, York also ran into that. Uh, York Beach was notoriously bad for cell coverage, similar to the fort, uh, quite frankly. Uh, they found that actually ended up becoming a, a revenue opportunity for the town because they installed an additional tower down there. And they, the, the first installation netted them roughly $12,000 in annual income. And they have the ability to put three more co-locations on the same tower. So that, that's how they, they found that as a workaround, was they provided the infrastructure that was needed for, say, Verizon and AT&T and Sprint to put a tower up. And then it, it also improved their performance with their, with their towers. So uh, that, was a, that was a positive result that happened. I can't say that that would happen here, but that would be something. There, there's also this mobile technology that was discussed probably about six months ago where a person was looking to do that up uh, Oh, up by, up by Crescent Terrace. Beach, yeah, Richmond Terrace. And uh, so that may be another option as well there to provide improved cell coverage down there. So, uh, but they, the gentleman from, uh, I think it's NTech was the company I think that we met with, uh, felt that they could put boosters up on top of them that would also amplify their signal. So you would overcome that. And I think that might have come from their experience in York trying to overcome the, 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 the poor beach coverage in the first season. Great. Thank you, Councilor Sarah. Uh, do we have to have public comment before we can start a discussion? Oh. I'm so sorry. Is there anyone from the public that would like to address this issue? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. <laughs> uh, okay. Continuing on. Any more questions, uh, Councilor Sarah? So, do we need a do we need a motion? Well, okay. I was going to ask. Okay. This is written in. Uh, uh, Two separate motions. If I'm in, I'm sure. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes, but you would need to come to the podium and give us your name and address, please. Um, so I'm Deb Kavanaugh, and I'm um, 16 Little John Road. And, and my question, and this, and because I've not been to previous council meetings where you've discussed this, I may have missed it, but because this was voted down twice in the past, is this something that would then go out to the public again, or is this something that's just going to happen here if, if it happens? That's my question. What the process is. Well, it, it has gone out to the public in the past. Uh, this council is moving forward with it as a council. I think um, there, it has been, I'm trying to think how many years since there were two referendums. One was before I was on the council. One I was just on the council, I believe, and perhaps you as well. Just before Caitlin, I went on the council. Just before. So that would have been 2010. Um, and so I will ask other councils to speak to that. My, my thought process is a great deal has changed since 2010. Um, the council, prior councils, decided to send it out to the voters, but there's no requirement to do that, and this, is a, this decision is certainly within the purview of the council. Okay. Yep, that answers And Jane, Councilor Garvin. Uh, Ms. Kavanaugh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but uh, what I think I'm hearing you say is that it, it seemed from your question that you're under the impression that this item is further along than it in fact is. Yeah, that's right. And so if I could just clarify that this is very much still in the due diligence and information gathering phase. Um, even the item to request the manager to solicit proposals is simply to have something for the council to react to. Um, there will still be multiple points at which both public input would be gathered uh, and public comment um, taken uh, before any vote would be taken on whether or not to, to go forward with this. Okay. So really this is just an item to continue the discussion at a future workshop date. Uh, allow the manager to go forth and gather some more information to bring back to us for consideration and have that be part of what, um, you know, uh, is a point of deliberation for us. Okay, thank you. Any, anyone else want to respond? No? Okay, thank you. Okay, so the first uh, draft motion, uh, is there a motion to refer the discussion of pay display at Fort Williams Park to a workshop on May 1st, 2018? So moved. moved. All right, so that was a, I took that as a I'll, move. I'll let Penny have it. Council Straw and <laughs> seconded by Councilor Second. Penny right. Jordan. Um, any further discussion? Councilor Straw? Right. Uh, so um, just because I know that we may end up with people out with pitchforks, um, as uh, Jamie noted, um, this is at the very preliminary stages. Uh, 
I normally never tell people how I vote in the um, ballot box, but I'll say this. I, uh, I opposed fees 10 years ago. Um, I didn't think they were appropriate. I don't think it's appropriate to restrict people's access to the ocean. Um, I now support fees. And the reason being that after my time on the Fort Williams Park Commission, we've now reached the point where there are so many cars coming in at peak season uh, that there's no parking left. And people are just parking on the grass and ignoring where the, the designated parking is. So we have to come up with a solution that somehow discourages people from coming during those uh, peak periods or otherwise carpooling. Um, because otherwise the solution is we add more parking and no one wants more parking lots in Fort Williams. Or otherwise we have to have someone at the gate turning people away. So we have to come up with some solution to encourage uh, carpooling during surge periods. At the same time, the Ford is also not self-sufficient, even though we've been attempting to make it self-sufficient for a while. We uh, derive revenue from building rentals, uh, from site rentals, from vendor fees, uh, from the buses. But despite that, the taxpayers are still funding Fort Williams on a per capita basis of something like 20 or $30 a year. Keeping that in mind, and then all of the visitors are effectively uh, having access for free. So we're, I'm supporting sending this to a workshop. I will support um, charging uh, parking fees at some point in, this fu in the future, but subject to the following conditions currently. Uh, I think entrance to the park should always be free. I think residents should be able to park for free because we're subsidizing the park. Uh, as Matt noted, perhaps if uh, it sounds like there might be some wrinkles we have to work out, but uh, I have a camp in Bridgeton and I have to pay $5 a year or something like that for my transfer station sticker. So if we're charging a fee for the transfer station st sticker, perhaps that will suffice. Um, also, I think that the parking should be free for everyone in the winter time, off season. So. Uh, come October or November, December, whatever we decide that we no longer have this massive surge. At that point, everyone can come, from, come, come in for free. You can enjoy the park and we start charging again uh, come the spring or the summer. And then finally, if, um, uh, if we are gonna do this, I'd like to see it done on a trial basis for one season. If we end up generating a small amount of revenue, perhaps it's not worth it. If it does generate a lot of revenue, at that point I'd like to send it to the voters. Uh, I personally think that, as you noted, this has happened twice, the voters have rejected it twice. Who are we, the town council, to say, hey voters, you're wrong, we know better. So I'd like to instead do it as a trial basis, collect the information, put it before the voters. Frankly, I'd put it before the voters at the same time that we vote on the next school budget. Uh, so we can make these decisions of, hey, this is costing us money. The state isn't giving us our fair share over here. Maybe we need to drive some revenue over here. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Are there any other comments? Councilor Garvin? Um, my comments don't pertain to the merits of the proposal so much as they do to some um, input I'd received from um, folks in the community. Um, I think there's a, a prevailing misconception among some in the community that in a year that we're facing a challenging budget, specifically on the school side of the budget, that, well, why don't we just simply raise revenues elsewhere? Um, and I just wanted to make the point that those two are, are rather mutually exclusive from one another. Um, revenues from one source are not able to be applied to another, so simply charging fees at Fort Williams does not uh, have any relative impact um, on the school budget or, or something else. Um, you know, whether or not ultimately fees at Fort Williams or anywhere else in town for anything else reduce the municipal tax burden on property taxpayers and how that impacts their perception of willingness to shoulder a higher tax burden from another area of the town budget, that's a personal decision that people can make. But um, I just wanted to, to throw out there and specifically following up on Chris's comment that, well, let's just decide these at the same time. There, there seems to be from people I've talked to a misconception about whether or not one would have any direct impact to the other and the answer is that it does not, so. Thank you, anyone else? Uh, is there, uh, oh, okay, we have a motion and it's seconded. Uh, all those in favor of referring the discussion of pay display of Fort Williams Park to a workshop on May 1st, 2018. All those in favor? It's unanimous, thank you. The second motion uh, that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council directs the town manager to request, I'm sorry, to create a request for proposals for providing pay display parking units for Fort Williams Park and to receive responses to the request from vendors. Is there a motion? Councilor Randall and a second. Councilor Garvin, any discussion? 
Councilor Garvin. So on the point that Chris just brought up about potentially trialing this, Matt, I don't know if in your research and your request for proposal, if you could include um, uh, proposals for both purchase as well as rental, um, so that if it's something that we decided we didn't want to move forward with after a trial period, we weren't on the hook for the equipment that we laid out for. Councilor Randall? And on another note, if you could just consider um, in gathering these proposals, the feasibility of the dump sticker or the, you know, the whatever we have for some kind of season pass, recycling how that, center. sorry, recycling <laughs> center, um, <laughs> how that would factor. And you're from Portland. <laughs> I don't know. I, I didn't go to the dump. You knew it was a dump. <laughs> it's a dump. I always call it dump. Um, just factor that into like the feasibility of each proposal and how that might affect the cost. Okay. Anyone else? I want to know, oh, can you see if they have barcode um, feasibility? Because if uh, we could barcode the citizens' cars, then when you go by and scan it, they could be exempt. You can put a sticker on yeah. with a... RFID. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Which is, I, excuse me, I, I think the same thing. I want a barcode. The software would be able to identify it. Yeah. <laughs> Council Lennon. Um, are we going to talk about buses at the same workshop and same time, or is that a different meeting? I think that's a different discussion. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes. Ma Just a quick response on that. Uh, there is a subcommittee that's working on the park committee right now, and we should be receiving a report back from them in a fairly short order. They're on the home stretch right now with that, with their efforts from that side. Thank you, Matt. And, and actually, I believe that they are going to have something by the May agenda. Okay. Uh, on that, that work that they've been doing. Oh, thank you. Anyone else? All those in favor? It's unanimous. The next item, number 59, Fort Williams Park Foundation request for naming the historic stone bandstand at Children's Garden at Fort Williams Park. Uh, let's see. Yes. Um, my wife is a current board member of the Fort Williams Park Foundation, and I have no doubt about my ability to consider the item objectively, but based on the appearance of a conflict of interest, I'm going to recuse myself from this issue. All right. Thank you, Councilor Garvin. You may step down. And at this point, I would like to, well, someone's already here. Uh, offer. Actually, Jessica, yeah. I don't know what the focus is of this, but to the extent it matters, uh, if we're talking about even the naming and the bricks, I have my family's name in one of the bricks, so well, I don't know what we're focused that, on here. That's not really the, okay, okay, the bricks are not the issue. Right. So anyway, so uh, yes, please give us your name and your address. Linton Schaefer, 650 Shore Road. I'm president of the Fort Williams Park Foundation. And um, I want to thank you, Chairman Sullivan and Town Councilor Sturgis for inviting us to submit this request. Um, we are requesting that the council formally name the Stone Circle, which is in the area we call the, the um, Children's Garden at Fort Williams Park, the council ring uh, over the years. This stone construction has had numerous names. Originally, it was built as a bandstand. It's uh, been identified as gazebo in various places, as a stone seating circle. And as we were looking for funding for the children's garden, we started referring to it as the council ring, which we felt had a more romantic connotation to it and or potential for um, fundraising. Basically, that, that we had no serious intention of naming, renaming, or anything else, it was basically an advertising name. Um, but since you have asked that we submit a request for it, we are doing so. We would love to be able to 
know that this stone ring is formally known as the council ring. Um, I don't know if it's important to you to know that this, the terminology was, was inspired by um, a, a landscape architect who had images of Jens Jensen, was his name, images of Viking circles, of Native American circles, of places where people gather to, in community for leadership, for community, for whatever gatherings might cause. And so that, that's where the terminology came from. Um, I think James McCain, our director, who is a landscaper, is the one who brought it forward. So that's the request, that we give this a formal name and that it be the council ring. And I'm happy to answer any questions about that. Are there any questions? No? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So what, what, uh, what I was thinking uh, with this is that it would be prudent to uh, send this request on to the Fort Williams Advisory Committee for their opinion, um, <laughs> as they are they uh, are work with us with policy and such things, but I don't know what other councils are thinking. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Oh, along with that, I was wondering if we could send the request to the Historical Society and see if they have an opinion on it or if they have any knowledge of what it could have previously been referred to, mm -hmm. and we could go from there. They are an active committee. I mean, not a, an official committee, but an active group in the community mm -hmm. that I think something like this would be worth asking them about. Thank you, that's a great point. Anyone else? Councillor Straw? I, I, um, it, so it seems like the naming policy is inapplicable, it would, just because it's not naming it after a person. So I, I'm confused as to what the standard is we're asking them for. Well, the, the standard is, is that it's a town structure. And okay. it was not, when the, the, the Children's Garden was approved, this, Stone uh, Bandstand was named as it had been named and called by the town for as long as it has existed. And so later on, after the council had approved the children's garden and its items, this new name of this structure had appeared. And this, this is a, a, a town structure that predated the children's garden and so this is, this is the something that needs to be approved by the council. Now, I, I grant you the naming policy is quite vague and probably we should update that because it, this is not naming after a certain person, but nevertheless, it's a town's own structure that um, the town should approve any change in how it's called or what it's named. And so it's just a matter of just going through the, the right process to do it, I think. Anyway, Councilor Penny Jordan. Um, a couple of things. Number one, it, it appears, and I'm just kind of catching up on this, it appears that uh, what uh, the foundation has tried to do is kind of um, rectify kind of the speeding ticket, so to speak, that they expedited a process. Um, and so I, initially when I looked at it, and I don't want you to take offense to this, I went, what? And then I started doing research around these circles. And I thought it was really kind of, uh, sorry, I'm gonna use this term, progressive, in, um, in that it really starts to denote um, almost a transformation of this, this space. And so if I think about it, and as I looked at it and I did my research around uh, council rings, it says that it's really, open to productions, and I think about all of the wonderful things that could be done with this particular um, 
stage, so to speak. And I started to understand why that council ring was um, identified as a name. And so I looked at the, I looked at the um, kind of naming guidelines and ordinance and I said, so what are the implications if it isn't a person's name? Um, what, what, what does that really, really mean? And so I personally, um, I think that I could support that this name occur um, and uh, that that's what it becomes because I really think it's a, a special space that's been created there for something, for many things that can happen. And I think if, if people started to understand Council Ring, it can really create a sense of community in this space. So I, I, I really appreciate the work that you did in coming up with the name. Thank you, anyone else? All right, and um, what do counselors think about asking both the Historical Society and the uh, Fort Williams Advisory Committee to give us their opinion on, on this request? All right, great. And I, I mean, I think the name is, is fascinating, and I, I think it would be a very apropos step. I just would like to see it happen the way it should happen, that's all. So anyway, could I have a motion to uh, refer this item to both the uh, uh, Fort Williams advice? Well, let me just backtrack on that. You know, I, I have to say I appreciate Caitlin, uh, Councillor Caitlin Jordan. I think that is a very interesting point. And but what I what occurs to me in the moment that I'd like councillors to address is that our Fort Williams Advisory Committee is a town appointed committee. Mm -hmm. And one of its jobs is to assist us with policy and so forth. That is not the situation with the Cape Elizabeth Historical Preservation Society. What might be a way to bring them in and not violate our, our own due process rules is to uh, notify the Historical Society and perhaps ask them to come to the Fort Williams Advisory Committee meeting and they can listen and comment. They can certainly come back and listen and comment, but I don't think in them, as I realize it, that they should be formally involved because they were not, they're not appointed officially as far as, you know, in a, any sort of a, a voting thing. I think they could offer an opinion, that's all. Yep. Well, that's, I mean, that's what okay. I'm asking. That's basically we yep. reach out to them and say, yep. do you have an opinion? Sure. I mean, yes, but it would one not. of our council goals for the last few years has been to make sure that we are mm -hmm. reaching out to the different community groups on various things that might sure. interest them. So that's exactly what I'm just saying. That's, Make sure we say, hey, to the mm -hmm. Historical Society, do you have an opinion? We'd love to hear it. Right. But I needed to catch myself because I was about to say we're going we're gonna to vote to send this to the Historical Society. I thought, no, that's not, that's not the way to handle it. Mm -hmm. Councilor Lennon? I mean, are we sending this to the Fort Williams Park Commission? Thank yes. You. For like their... Their opinion. Right. So it's just an informal... I mean, they don't... They can't override... I'm, I'm wondering... What, what is, what, Why we when we it? send it, what is the explanation? Just, hey, we want to know what you guys think, or we think it's great, do you think it's great? Or is it like, you have the ultimate say? I don't understand the levels of decision making here. Well, what we would do is we would send this onto the Fort Williams Advisory Committee for their opinion. Okay. And we would weigh their opinion carefully. We might not agree with it. Okay. So but, they do not they do not override the council. But given that this is a structure within right. Fort Williams Park and we have a town council appointed advisory committee, I think it's at the very least a courtesy. Okay. And it seems actually, to me the foundation should have a large say because they raise the money, correct? For it, they do, but they are a private organization and they don't have any bearing on the public process. Okay. So. Anyway, uh, Matt, do you want to say something? Just had one uh, item that I don't know if it would be helpful for Councilor Jordan or not. In James McCain's memo to the council, he does talk about the history uh, of that, stating that uh, it was referred to originally uh, as the gazebo on the town's, uh, on, on our town's facilities website. And then, uh, and then in 1909, the, it was like, called the Bandstand and Officers Row Preserve. Uh, and from there, it was called Bandstand for, for the longest time. And then uh, even he did cite a local historian, Ken Thompson, uh, had a book uh, about the park, Portland Headlight and Fort Williams, uh, that it was always referred to as a bandstand historically. So that's a, 
just for point of context. So there may be further clarification that the Historical Society could provide as well to that. But just uh, he, he did a nice job on his memo, I thought. Thank you. Uh, uh, anything else? Councillor Penny? I don't, I don't uh, object to it going to the advisory commission, but I would like a time frame on it. It's like, um, don't drag this out. It's, it should be a pretty quick thing to come back and say, uh, here's our opinions. So if we could put a time frame on it, it'd be good. Well, I think that, you know, we could ask the town manager to relay that request yep. to the chairman of the Hawaii's advisory good. committee, and likely they would be able to put that on their next agenda. I cool. mean, this is not an emergency. But I think that you know to be to be timely and yeah. effective, that I I don't think there'd be any problem with that. Cool. So thank you. Good. Yep. We do have the good fortune of Mark Russell being here this evening as a member of the committee, so <laughs> and the, the, oh, they're meeting the the Very first week in May as well. So okay. uh, the, that's a good effective communication. <laughs> right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Anything else? All those in favor? I'm sorry. Did we have a motion? Oh, do we have a motion? Oh, okay. yeah, my yeah. gosh. All right. Is there a motion? Is there a motion to? Uh, where am I? Hey, do I just make it? Uh, it's the second one. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm not, we're down here. Is there a motion to forward the Fort Williams Park Foundation request for naming the historic stone bandstand in the Children's Garden at Fort Williams Park to the Fort Williams Park Advisory Committee for their opinion on the request? Councilor Lennon. So moved. Councilor jo Penny, uh, Caitlin Jordan. I just want to add and notify the Historical Society. Oh, thank you. Yep, and to also notify the Historical Society so that they may participate right. uh, in public comment. So, well, you had a, you have made the motion. I need a second. This is it. So this is your second. Okay, thanks. Uh, any more discussion? All those in favor? All right, it's six zero. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, item number 60, proposed drone policy, and we are missing, well, he'll be back. Okay, um, I am actually the responsible um, party for this because we have had in the last several years, um, several citizens have written to the council asking uh, about drones at Fort Williams Park. Um, and so, um, in the past, uh, we, uh, with our prior town manager, we, we took this up briefly, but the F, let's see, was it the FAA, what was it? Anyway, yep. the, fed, the federal government had not made all its rulings about these things, and so the, we decided at the time, the thought was, well, let's wait a couple years and see where things land with the uh, Federal Aviation uh, Authority, I think is what it is. Uh, so anyhow, uh, not wanting to forget about that because it's a recurring issue, I, I asked um, our town manager to uh, do a little research uh, with the town attorney on what what we might consider. Um, so before I get it, we get into that, is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak to this item? Okay, seeing no one. So <clears throat> anyway, uh, thinking that perhaps it's time to start thinking about a policy, a drone policy. Um, one of the issues, and I'm going to turn this over to Matt in a second, but one of the issues that has been raised in the recent past about this has to do with public safety. How many drones at a time? What if they crash, you know, and fall and hurt people? Um, should people have an expectation that they would be having their family picnic in relative privacy, or are they going to be filmed unknowingly by a drone? There are lots of issues that this brings up. So my, my thought is that we talk about this and consider putting this to a workshop uh, involving also the Fort Williams Park Committee, um, maybe perhaps ultimately send it to ordinance, but I, I, don't, I don't want us to forget about this. I think it's something we need to deal with. So anyway, and let me then turn it over to Matt. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm happy to report on this. I, I did have the opportunity to speak with Mike Hill, who works for us as the town's attorney at Monaghan Leahy, and he did some uh, he did some did some good research on this. And ultimately, uh, as the chairman did note, uh, the FAA does have the preemptive powers over the regulation of drones, and uh, 
you know, if you have one, you need to license it with them. And uh, but that's pretty much the extent of it. Uh, part of the concern, obviously, is Fort Williams Park is amazingly close to the flight patterns of people coming into Portland uh, on a very regular basis. That's one of the one of the primary approaches. So they have a high level of concern, I would think, over that. Uh, Additionally, there, there are thoughts about the number of folks who do go to Fort Williams on a day-to-day -day basis throughout the, the, the nicer parts of the year and the possibility of interactions that may not end well uh, with the public at the fort, as well as privacy concerns. So the question to Mike Hill was, do we have the ability to regulate the use? And his, he has found that, quite frankly, uh, municipalities and other states have implemented prohibitions on flying or launching drones uh, on or over municipal parks. Uh, with an express exclusion for uh, lawful and authorized use by law enforcement agencies or emergency services, where they, they may use that for, say, a, a search and rescue type of approach uh, or, or other, other types of uses. Um, interestingly enough, uh, there have been some successful challenges to various local ordinances which require the licensing of drones. So you can regulate them to a certain point, but uh, maybe not to the point that you need to license them in town, but you may be able to say you cannot use them over, those, over there without their express permission. Looking at the Fort Williams ordinance or Fort Williams Park ordinance, it's not a listed as a permitted use, so the language would then be that if it's not a permitted use, then it is a prohibited use. So if it's not expressly you know, listed as, as a use that's, a, that's allowable. So you actually, his thought is you have the ability to, to say now, from this point forward, it's not allowed, not allowed period. And there's some protection that you would have to, to go down that road. Speaking with staff today at the department head meeting, and, and specifically speaking with Bob Malley about this, the concern is that it's not just Fort Williams. That, you know, we have Gullcrest, we have you know, little, the Winnick Woods, we have Poor farm parcels, we have athletic fields where you, know, you just think about a football game on a Friday night and someone decides that they want to fly their drone over the football field. Uh, we may need to have this as a full policy for all town and school facilities where <coughs> you may want to think about that holistically or, or, or universally a larger, at a larger scale. So uh, that's kind of where we're at on that. You do have the, so long and short of it is you do have the ability to regulate that or prohibit it if you so choose. Uh, you may, it may be some, something as easy as, as, a, as a policy versus having to come up with an ordinance. But, uh, but it is something that you may, I would recommend at least pushing to a workshop uh, in the fairly near future to, to have a full and hearty discussion on and decide if you want to do that. Or you can just tell me, Matt, craft a, craft a policy or come back with something else uh, or, or work with the ordinance committee if that's the route that you want to go for. Uh, but you do have the ability to do pretty much anything that you'd, like, that you'd like to do as far as regulating that. But it is, the one request that did come back from staff was to think about not specifically just to the fort, but, but everything because there are areas that it interacts on a, on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So what are councilors thinking? Send this to a workshop, Council Randall? Um, Thank you for bringing this up. I think this is a very important privacy and safety issue. Um, rather, Matt, are you suggesting that rather than limiting our workshop at this time to the Fort Williams Park, we just consider a, a town-wide drone policy? That'd be my recommendation, as to look at look at town and probably town and school properties uh, because they both have a high level of interactions and, yeah, like you said. Privacy is another very legitimate concern that exists there. So, uh, you know, over what we can control or what the town can control, then I think that's, you want to look at a big picture versus a narrow focus. Councilor Lennon? Do you want a motion? I would love one. Okay. Uh, I move that uh, we refer the subject of drones um, on all town and school properties to a future town council workshop. Um, Thank you. Is there a second? Councilman second. Randall. Any more discussion? All the folks, I'm sorry. Um, I have to say I was really confused, frankly, by the supporting document in the packet with this, um, particularly the last paragraph on page two. And Matt, you kind of alluded to it a little bit, but um, it seemed to indicate that 
um, whenever local governments attempt to do anything here, that um, there, there are numerous reasons why the federal regulations apply and overrule, and there were multiple citations of challenges. So if further to the point you were making, it sounds like any real potential for us as a community is in strictly prohibiting and not trying to regulate. Is that what I'm hearing? That's been the most successful okay. approach the towns have taken. So um, I fully support this going to a workshop. I do have some concerns, though, because I think that there are a number of potential very legitimate non-police um, or public safety um, uses that we might not want to inadvertently um, prohibit. I, I think of some commercial purposes, like more and more um, realtors are using these to get aerial photographs of properties that they're trying to sell. We have a lot of real estate um, companies in town um, that you know would have a very legitimate reason for that. Events, um, you know, if somebody's holding an event like a wedding or something uh, that is looking for aerial photography, even you know the number of beautiful videos that I see online that people have taken at Fort Williams that, you know, present Cape Elizabeth as a beautiful place to be and, and um, you know, present our community really favorably. I, I think, I understand the public safety issues, but I also think that there's, um, there's uh, some potential legitimate use that we might not want to curtail. So anyway, um, given your comment that the best way to not run into friction with these things is to strictly prohibit. I, I look even more cautiously at any action that we might take as a result. Thank you, Councilor Randall. Um, I know we'll discuss this more at the workshop, but just to clarify, we don't have to, it's not a blanket prohibition or nothing, right? We can prohibit selectively. So it's just that we can't, we can't permit we can only prohibit, but we can selectively prohibit in a way that permits other uses. Yeah, and, and, and again, it come, if, if I may, yes. Madam Chair, yeah. uh, if, you're, if you're also looking at it, you're looking at just the town's properties, not right. uh, say, you know, if you want to fly a drone over your, over your, over your house, uh, you're perfectly fine to do that within your airspace, if you will, uh, or if you had, you know, or if say, say someone wanted to do it at a larger scale, something at, like this, at the Sprague properties. We we're looking at a couple thousand acres. They would have that ability to do that. It's just this would just be regulating it over uh, and operating on on or above the town properties. But there, but yeah, you could. There is some level there that if you if you wanted to say, you know, the senior class picture wanted to have their picture taken in the grandstand at at the foot at the at the turf field, then you would you know you could commercially probably license something like that, or just say you could you could have that for that, and that'd be more of a special special circumstance. Uh, Council Lennon is next. Um, I think we should flush this out of workshop. I, I think we should keep moving. I, I made the motion, but I'm not sure anyone seconded it. Second. Okay. okay. All right. I mean, I agree with what everyone's saying, but yeah, this is a longer workshop. conversation. Yes. Like, let's turf it and keep going. Great. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, item number 61, uh, Conservation Committee recommendation relating to the request of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust for funding the purchase of Robinson Woods 3. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak to this item? Hi, Elizabeth Goodspeed, 59 Belfield Road. Um, since we have discussed this at length with you guys in workshop as well as the Conservation Committee, we don't have any prepared statements tonight, but I wanted to say there are several board members in the audience, so if there are specific questions that we can help with, um, please just let us know. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> we received a uh, memo from the Conservation Committee, um, which you all have uh, seen. Basically, they're, uh, they are uh, supporting this request. Um, however, they recommend that this be subject to an easement held by the town similar to the town easement provided for the glue property. So I'd like to ask the town manager to further tee this up and then we'll entertain a motion and have some discussion. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd be happy to. Uh, the, the Conservation Committee, after being snowed out one time, uh, had the opportunity to meet with the Land Trust to, to explore the, uh, the request. And uh, they, they did look at it, uh, or I guess com completely, uh, and they did come back with the recommendation was to, uh, was to go forward with or recommending the support of the purchase uh, by the town. Uh, their, uh, their one area that they looked at was specifically uh, to have uh, similar language that was in the easement uh, specific to the glue property, which is one of the most recent, uh, one of the most recent uh, purchases. Uh, haven't had the opportunity to talk with Land Trust or with, with Cindy about it, but uh, but I think that that was the only area that you know they they may have provided uh, some conversation. I don't know what the conversation was at the uh, at the interaction with the conservation committee that night, but it didn't seem like that was a, a an obstacle that couldn't be overcome uh, or or a red flag. It was just that was one area that they thought was important to have. But they did note the, that they felt that there was a high I value of the property for preservation and its alignment with the, the goals of the Green Belt Plan, which, they, which, as you know, the Conservation Committee was uh, was you know, integral mm -hmm. in, its, in the creation of uh, for the council to adopt. Okay. Um, one one way I thought we could proceed because there are two parts to their recommendation, which was recommending that we somehow uh, support the request uh, for the purchase, but also um, consider that we uh, make this subject to an easement. And so maybe the way to proceed is just talk about the financial aspect and then once the council has agrees on what that is, then consider making that subject to an easement. I don't know. This is what I'm thinking, but anyway. Councilor Lennon. Um, do you mind if I ask someone from CELT what they think, their feelings about the easement? Just so we have a full picture of, I mean, I understand why the Conservation Commission recommends it, but I'm just curious what they think. Well, yes, but before we do that, the other, the other thought about the easement, what would happen if, you know, if we decided to do that is then we would likely engage the town attorney again, like we did in the past with the group property, to craft that language, which would then go back and forth, as it has in the past, to the land trust for, you know, agreement. But anyway, is the council willing to hear from someone on the, on the land trust? Sure. Yep. Just oh. curious. Okay. I, I am, but I'm also curious, uh, being new, uh, did we have these easements for the prior grants? So, well, so. the only one that, that's fairly recent is the glue property. And that one uh, went back and forth. And ultimately, the easement that the town council agreed upon, easement language, was not what the town attorney recommended the council do. So, uh, but but that that was the uh, the most recent example that I can think of. I don't know, you know. Going forward, we could certainly get more information on past uh, agreements, but this one I think was, uh, I would say, it was most aggressive. You could it, put it. This was a this was a a uh, a town council effort to uh, have more say in the property, how it's used, and so forth, for all the tax dollars that are used to, are, you know, that are given to the land trust for that purpose. So that was the intent. Um, and so it was, you know, there was a great deal that was achieved by that. It wasn't all that, that some of us wanted, and it was not what the town attorney recommended that we sign, but the majority of the council went along with it. So that's the history of that. So anyway, so uh, your name and address, please. Good evening, uh, David Ryan, uh, mm -hmm. 997 Shore Road. Okay, so Councilor Lennon has a question. Yeah, I'm just curious what he, what he, I mean, maybe it's not even crafted enough for you to be able to respond, but you have a ton of experience with easements and you guys have worked um, a lot collaboratively with the Conservation Committee, so do you have any just initial thoughts? Well, I was at the, uh, at the Conservation Committee here that took place a couple of weeks back, and I mean, I, they can obviously you know, speak to it, um, but they were pretty clear that uh, the, the relationship, the cooperation, um, the, the partnership that they, uh, I think, felt in the 
evolution of, I think, how you referred to it, the glue property is great fun too, was what they wanted. Uh, and it's frankly what we wanted. Um, it's better when we're working in concert. I don't think there's any question that there is a substantial overlap between what we are trying to achieve and what the conservation committee wrote up in the most recently adopted Green Belt Plan. Um, we were unequivocal. Um, it, it's working, and we were absolutely willing to offer the same public access easement uh, that is in place right now, which in itself was a, uh, probably from your perspective, uh, uh, an advance over the uh, public access easement that was provided uh, in connection with the Robinson Woods 2 acquisition. Uh, so I don't think you need to look further necessarily than what was done on the uh, And then certainly speak to your own committee um, to see how it's working. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, uh, oh, where were we going in the middle of that? I can't remember. Because that one just kind of jumped. This is far as what the, what the council would like yeah. to do next is what they yeah. want to have or have more discussion now. Okay. Would the council like to have more discussion now? Do you want to go to another workshop on this? Um, what What are people's thoughts? Councilor Caitlin Jordan. I, I'd like, I mean, I understand they're on a time crunch, but I'd like to go to another workshop, I mean, and hear right. from Matt about all the numbers and how it's going to affect budgets, and I need a more detailed understanding of dollars. Yeah, right. So I agree with Caitlin. Thinking? So I'll make that into a motion if you want, um, make it move it along. Okay. Okay. Wait, oh, wait. well, wait a minute. I would just like to add to your motion, maybe in the interest of efficiency, we could, at that same workshop, um, hash out this whole easement thing and the conservation committee could come and explain it to us because whatever. So we do the whole thing at one workshop. Motion to go to workshop okay. to discuss all things related to the acquisition <laughs> of Robinson Woods. I Three. second it. All right, second, <laughs> seconded by Council Penny Jordan. Um, yep, any more discussion? And, and just to, to clarify, uh, Council Lennon, that we will rely on the town attorney for the easement language. You know, we can certainly put the parameters up there of what we want, but it was will be the attorney that deals with them yeah. ultimately with that. Yes, I just want to understand it. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, I, my guess is that there's uh, we have enough support for this, um, but before we go down the road of bringing in the attorney and incur incurring attorney fees, do we want to at least get uh, some sense of whether a majority of the town council is going to support spending the money? Uh, well, I think I think we can go to the workshop and wait on that. I mean, I think that you know this is a great deal of money. We have nothing remotely close to that in our in our right. land acquisition fund. Right. So, and we have many other uh, budget concerns. Councilor Kaylin Jordan, just to speak to your concern about contacting the attorney, the the last easement that we wrote was took a long time. I'm not sure that we would need to change much if they're amendable. We're amendable. You know, for the most part, I'm saying that what was drafted is already something we can pull in as our starting point, which we wouldn't need much more than that for our workshop. That's a good point. So we have a motion. We have a second motion. Uh, all those in favor? It's unanimous. All right. And the next item is number 62, the town center intersection. Recently, the town council received an email regarding safety concerns, pedestrian crossing at the intersection of Route 77 and Scott Dyer Road and Shore Road. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak to this item? Seeing no one? Uh, yes, you all saw the email uh, from Mrs. Reddington, wrote to me, I responded. And so at this point, I'd like to ask the town manager to get us up to speed. He has met with Chief Williams, and so there are some thoughts on how to move forward with this. Another workshop. <laughs> <laughs> but this is just for the public. Uh, we had a citizen that requested we take a look at this intersection. And this intersection has been, you know, of a concern for many years. And so here we are again. And I think that um, from what I understand, uh, the police chief has some interesting thoughts on what, what could be done fairly quickly. So, uh, Matt, if you could. 
Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm happy to, to chime in. Uh, I did have the opportunity, after, as I'd written back uh, to the citizen who had expressed her concerns about this, Ms. Reddington, uh, that I would follow up with the chief on Monday. And I did sit down with Neil. Uh, we did have quite an extensive conversation about it. One of his thoughts, well, one of the, one of the first thing, thoughts that came to mind is that's one of the least used crosswalks, the one that we have right over here. So the volume of traffic, uh, unfortunately for pedestrians, is not a, it's not a high used area. The, one of the big concerns, obviously, is one of the areas that is a fairly high used one, and it's the one that goes from the old Cumbies to the new Cumbies, which is not a crosswalk. Uh, right. That's something where we need to work on a heightened level of awareness that people if they do want to get something from Cumberland Farms, they may want to use the higher, uh, well, the higher visibility of the actual real crosswalk. That being said, uh, I asked the chief, I said, well, what if we put a crossing guard at this crosswalk over here to ensure that there may be better compliance with it? Uh, he had sig significant reservations about that and explained it to me, uh, quite frankly, that once we, we populate that, that crosswalk with a crossing guard, we own it. Mm -hmm. uh, and to have per, a person there during times that, you know, versus I guess you can see the Scott Dyer Road crossing guards who we have across from uh, the, you know, uh, Tom Atwell's house and the other one across from the end of uh, uh, Hill Way. Those are really heavily used crosswalks and that's why we have crossing guards there. And as, as you may or may not know, uh, on days when that crossing guard may be ill, we have to populate that with a policeman. Uh, so, uh, so we, we own those, uh, for lack of a better term. But he didn't feel that that had the level of use that would, that would necessitate us to own it. So we had to think about other options. Uh, and, and Ms. Reddington's email was spot on. Uh, due to the width of that road, uh, if car, you know, car number one is the responsible driver and stops for a moment to let a pedestrian cross, car number two, who may not be a responsible driver, uh, says, hey, traffic flows like water. I'm going to pull to the right and slide right along on the inside, and there you have a problem because you have the interaction with the car and a person where they shouldn't be interacting. Uh, I had to go back to my old counselor days in Gray. We had a similar situation in front of our in front of Russell School and Fiddlehead Center where we had a lot of kids crossing to go to, to daycare center. Really wide road, Route 26, and a lot of cars passing on the right when other people were being responsible. There are traffic calming measures that you can do, uh, mm -hmm. such as, you know, one of them could be as simple as almost like painting a teardrop, you know, to, to let folks know at that intersection to kind of shape it up, you know, towards that to, to give the, like a visual cue that it's narrow here. Uh, that's be a, that would be a good first start. Um, and suddenly the question comes to mind, that's a state road. Well, that's in the urban compact. We own that. So we actually have the ability to be able to put some, you know, that'd be like a level one traffic calming measure that we could put into place there. And we could do it this summer. You know, once we start painting, we could, you know, we're not the first people who've come up with trying to get that type of uh, situation painted. We could get that laid down there to try to help improve the safety around that. The second step from there would be possibly saying in the future, narrow that down a little bit, cozy it up. So folks, don't do that. And, and you, it doesn't like, not like we have to reshape all of the intersection of 77, because as you know, years, years back, the council looked into that fairly heavily and it didn't, it, it, there were a lot of challenges that came to it. One of them was a price tag because of the taking that would have to take place to, to reconfigure the Scott Dyer and Shore Road intersection at 77. So uh, for, for, to get to cut to the chase on it, I think the initial direction would be to, to get that painting down uh, once we can get, you know, get that, especially in time for, for at least the, the beginning to middle of the summer, and be ready for the next school season to come up, uh, and then look at how that might be effective, and then perhaps look in the future to do a more of an infrastructure type improvement where you could curb it out and have that shape, and it may also slow traffic down. Uh, that's another, another benefit that would come from that in the future if you end up doing it like an infrastructure improvement and curbing it and narrowing it. Would, um, uh our, our uh, recommendation uh, here is to put this to a workshop. We're going to have to be yeah. busy at workshops. But um, could we expect at that workshop that our police chief would be able to give us some diagrams, uh, you know, some schematics of how this 
you know, just to show us what he's thinking, how it would look, and you know, something that we can look at this more of a graphic nature. We could work with, uh, you know, with the town's engineer. Mm -hmm. We could have them do something show along those lines. How yeah. This would look. So anyway, yes, Councilor. I have two quick questions. One is, um, I thought one of her points was that the pl two places where we have crossing guards are much less dangerous roads. They're narrower, they're, they're, they're not major roads. So I think, I thought she was saying, can we take one of those instead of adding a whole nother? She was sort of asking, why is this crazy intersection where people are pulling in out of cumbies and the kids are running across to the new cumbies and why is it necessary to have the cross, like one of them, I guess they're like, you know, 200 yards apart. So that's a question that I would like Neil to answer to us too. Why are there, it seems to me there are too many crossing guards here and not enough where the big problem is. And my second question is, um, I totally agree with her about the pulling around because my kids used to come from Fox Run and I couldn't let them cross the road by themselves because that very same problem, the commuter wouldn't realize there was a child crossing. So, you know, you see in Portland, they're doing that a lot now where they're just building the brick sidewalk. You've seen that like um, as you're going up High Street with a cross on yes. Spring, they just built it out like pretty significantly. So it's down to one lane. So I'd love to know from him, like, what, what does that look like and is it really expensive? And we wouldn't have to be so dramatic, but if we put our sidewalks out a little bit, I think it would have the dual purpose of protecting pedestrians, but also encouraging commuters to slow down. Sure. If I may, I have, yeah. I have two quick answers to that as well. Uh, first one is on the, uh, on the two crossing guards, uh, you know, 100, 100 yards apart, they're both <laughs> heavily worked. Okay. Uh, for years, they've tried to get people to stop using the the road that runs through Tom Atwell's driveway, uh, <laughs> and go up to go up the hillway. And it it it's Sheila yeah. Lloyd's now. Yeah, it's it's just it's a, it's a traffic, and they they are both that that's a big volume. And on the second one, uh, we did a safer grant. They had the safer safe routes to schools grant that we pursued in gray, and it was like sixty grand we received to help do that to improve that, and that. That'd be something I also want to throw into the mix, uh, you know, if we wanted to go to the next level to, to more of, a, of an infrastructure improvement there. Um, you know, that's why I, I think, yeah, talking with Neil about that and, and Bob as well, uh, they were both, they both thought we could work around that, but, but I'd want to pursue a grant if they still, if they still have that available as well to, to try to help. And the other question is, and I think you're right on, Councilor Lennon is, Scott Dyer Road is 25 miles an hour and it's, like right. 35 out here, and you hope that people are going 35. Also, Penny Jordan. And I know this will be at the workshop as well, but I think what we can't lose sight of, and um, having grown up in this town and know that most of the young people who were walking to school and using those crosswalks came from Elizabeth Park. We're shifting gravity. We want our town to be walkable. We want, we created a beautiful path. We want to put sidewalks on Fowler Road and Mitchell Road and all of these things. And so uh, I understand what Chief Williams is saying, but I think we need to recognize the change that's happening in our town. And as I'm driving today down 77 and see five kids crossing the road, across Cumbies to the old Cumbies, it's like we own this problem and we can sit and say, oh, we'll own that uh, crossing guard if we put one there. We have an accountability to make sure that people can cross roads safely. And if we're going to create a town center, then we need to own those issues and not deny that they exist. So. I, I hear you. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Any other uh, thoughts, comments? Could I have a motion? Councillor Caitlin Jordan? I move that we refer this to a future workshop. Maybe our With workshops are getting yeah. pretty full. <laughs> this might have to get pushed to June, I'm just yeah, saying. We're gonna be busy. It's yeah. a lot of workshop <laughs> motions tonight. I know, talk about snow days. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a second? Councillor Lennon, any more discussion? All those in favor, it's unanimous, thank you. All right, at next item is number 63, corporate credit card agreement with People's United Bank. And uh, the town manager has this all ready. 
Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, happy to, to bring this back, and uh, you'll be happy to note that this one does not need a referral to a future workshop. <laughs> uh, this is for action this evening, hopefully. Uh, we are looking to change our relationship uh, on, on, on our corporate credit cards for the town. Uh, right now, uh, we have multiple departments, and they each receive individual credit card bills for their departments, and it's a processing nightmare for our, uh, for our business office, quite frankly. Uh, this is a, a, a good deal for the town as well. Uh, it's, a, it's a cash back type of card situation. Uh, and we do have a, a, a very well established relationship with People's United Bank. Uh, they do handle a good portion of our, uh, of our uh, CDs. We've got about a three, well, we have a three and a half million dollar CD that's gonna be ripening on the 15th. And uh, they like our business uh, and they we were recently, re we'll, we'll, we, we will be redoing that for a whole percentage point greater than we were receiving on the last one. So uh, there's a lot of good things going on with this. This, this will also allow us to process our payments on, on, out of uh, one, under one umbrella. So, and they'll be able to identify that and, and take care of it in a much more effective way than we, than we currently have. Thank you. Is there a motion? Councilor Garvin? Sure. Is there a second? <laughs> <laughs> <Don't move. laughs> And uh, there was a second by Councilor Straw. Is there any discussion? Do they come pick up our deposits every day too? <laughs> Keep trying. <laughs> no discussion. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Madam Chair, if I could. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah, we have a signature. I, I, do, have, I do have one, uh, the form that we did provide this evening. I, I, I'll definitely need the chairman's signature, and if I could uh, impose upon at least two other counselors to sign this before you leave tonight so I could process that, uh, uh, I would be eternally grateful. So just as a follow-up. Thank you. Well, I've signed it. You can hand it to the finance chair for his John Hancock. <laughs> Okay, um, <clears throat> item number 64, draft code of ethics, town council rules. Uh, the town council has had uh, discussed these uh, revisions at several meetings. Uh, most recently on March 21st, we did also discuss this on February 12th. Um, there was a consensus agreement on, the, on the, all the edits in the uh, code of ethics what we sent back to the town attorney was a request to consider how our code of ethics interfaces with our town council rules. So that's why it went back again to our town attorney. Um, <clears throat> so I know that he has weighed in on this and so I'll let Matt uh, report that, that thought. But again, there was at a workshop general consensus that the edits themselves are are fine. The concept was let's see if this interfaces correctly with town council rules or smoothly. And uh, so, anyway, so Matt, if you could speak to that. I'd be happy to, Madam Chair. Uh, I did have the opportunity to talk with Tom Leahy, uh, who, provide, who did have the opportunity to review the edits that were made at the last workshop where this was discussed. And uh, he felt that the edits that were done there were fine. Uh, I did raise with him that the, the question relating to any challenges that might exist between. Uh, our council rules and then the town's uh, ethics. And he felt that you know, on the rules side, it would provide you the process by which you can uh, employ them. And then on the ethics side is kind of what, what, what your consideration is to, to determine if, if you're in violation. But he felt that as they were structured now, he felt that there wasn't an obstacle that would exist between the two uh, working together. Uh, so he, he felt you, the, the council would be well served to go forward at this point in time if, if they so chose. So, so the, in other words, the town attorney is not recommending that there be any further changes to either our code of ethics or our town council oh. rules, that, that they will be able to work back and forth and smoothly. Correct. Um, if needed. So is there, um, let's see if we can get motions on the table and go to discussion. Uh, let's see. Well, let me have some, dis could we have some discussion first before we have a motion or would someone like to make a motion? Um, we can adopt them. We can further edit. We can further, we can send them back to the town attorney again. Councilor Lennon. 
I move we adopt the uh, draft code of ethics town council rules as set forth in our packet. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Randall? Okay. Discussion. Is there any discussion? Councilor Straw? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I, th I think they do work together. Um, I think the additional concern now that we've addressed uh, most of the issues with the code was the town council rules section six um, sentence three um, says that basically we shall, we're, we're required to every single time someone discloses vote. And I thought that was the point is we wanted to make that permissive, that sentence three rather than having shall. So yes, they work together, but it's technically if we're following everything to the letter, it creates this onerous every single time disclose vote, disclose vote, disclose vote when even though we might say, of course not, that's preposterous, it doesn't actually raise a, anything that we're concerned about. So we, I thought we, what we wanted to do was make it instead of a shell in that third sentence, something that makes it permissive. If any one of us says, I've got a concern, at that point that one person can call a vote. But otherwise, if it's something innocuous like, uh, Caitlin says, oh, I, sell, I sold three lobsters to um, the, the golf club last year. <laughs> like, of course that's not gonna in, in any way influence her. But uh, I thought the, the focus had turned into mandatory disclosure, but whether or not the rules mandate that we must vote every single time would be changed. Thoughts? Councilor Randolph? I echo precisely what Chris said, and that was my issue when reading through, that I, I don't think they work quite as smoothly as we had hoped. I agree. Okay. I did raise that with, uh, with uh, uh, Attorney Leahy, and it's kind of nuanced, I guess, would be the way that he puts it. Looking at uh, where it says the counselor may raise the point of order, and, but so if that person does, you know, they may, or they may not raise that point of order, uh, but if they do raise it, then the council shall, uh, you know, once it gets raised, then you do kind of have to address it. Uh, for, for lack of a better term, this, this, sets out, this sets out the process by which that the counselors would have to make that determination. So if you felt that you, know, you needed to bring it up, then, then the council has to basically address it at that point in time. Uh, I think Sarah's next, the council wanted. I'm just curious why he can't tweak the language a tiny bit to echo what Chris is saying, because I completely agree with him. I think there should be a really low bar to just mentioning what might be possible so everyone knows, like the Caitlin example is perfect. Sorry to use but not then have to go into this whole vote thing, which is completely distracting to the smooth moving forward of our agenda. And I also think it would then raise the bar for people to mention it because it's such a hassle. So it'd be like, oh, I, don't, I won't mention this because I don't want to put people through it. So I don't understand why he can't tweak the language to say, you, you, you could, if you feel you could. like it, mention, I mean, you should mention it if you have anything, but the council can informally say, thank you, we got it, like it happened tonight. Um, unless occasionally we do vote, so maybe he can distinguish those times when it rises to that level where we have to actually vote and the person sits down. Okay, thank you. If he can do that. If, if you, yeah. well, uh, oh, I was just going to say that I, I think you could do it just by changing the word to may. We, exactly. we may vote or we may not. You, you, you may just move on or you may take a vote. That's, mm -hmm. I mean, just Instead one of, of shall, may. Right. That's just the whole. The I mean, yeah. Yeah. you spend like yeah. days in law school just learning <laughs> shall, may, shall, may. <laughs> Okay. Um, Please just change the word. Yeah, Matt, change the word. If, if I, Matt, Matt is going to add something. If, if I could. Uh, no, you be, may uh, not. Be happy. <laughs> <laughs> I, sh I shall raise this point at this point in time. Uh, it's, it's the council's role, uh, councilors, council's rules. So you have the ability to change that if you, right. if you so choose. And if you want to change that shall in that next sentence to may, you have every right. Oh, good. To be able to do that, it's not. Uh, it wasn't brought down on stone tablets. You, it's, it's still kind of paper. So, so if I'm so if I'm reading this correctly, correctly in section six, it would be the third sentence from the end of that paragraph, which currently reads: All resolutions of conflict of interest issues shall be by majority vote of the remaining town council members and after citing applicable statutory provisions. So is that the sentence the, you would change shall to may? The third from the top of the paragraph. Third from the top? Yep. 
begins the balance of the town uh, council members after reviewing applicable statutes may by majority vote determine if the member has a conflict. Right. Okay. So both of those should be No, made? just you the first one. one. Just, just the first one at the top, not the one at the bottom. All right. It, so uh, the only sentence I would change is, uh, I'd, re <laughs> I'd rewrite the whole thing, but if we're doing the, the, taking this approach, the third sentence, the balance of the town council members after re reviewing applicable statutes may by majority vote determine if the member has a conflict. Okay. All right. the, it, in, um, oh, it's not that one, it's the town council rules. I know, I think I... If in I, number, I May raise the point, and then that shell, that shell right there. That should is, probably be changed. Should be changed to I, I, You know, I'm wondering if that other sentence, the sentence that I read, should, should also yeah, be changed. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting yeah. the, uh, but I was, you were to I was one. hand up to say that. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, this, I, so both have to become the top and the bottom. Okay. What do others think about that? Okay. Any, any other thoughts? So, uh, may I, could I uh, have a motion that um, in the, yeah, I'm sorry. I think we have a pending motion right now. Do we, do we have a motion? Do we have a motion? I, don't, I don't think so. Oh, no, am I no. mistaken? No. I no. Thought, um, I yeah, I thought you made okay, a motion. Okay, so. Yes, we do. We do? Two. I didn't think by I was Sarah different. and seconded by Valerie. Oh, thank oh. you. Yeah, oh. All right. So, so, I, so I well, don't. The, that motion. Um, it can be amended. Can I rescind my amend. motion? You can Somebody amend can, it or withdraw it, sir. Somebody can make a motion to amend. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So we have who who made our initial motion? Sarah. Sarah. Caitlin second. No, Valerie. Okay. Rand Randall seconded. So Sarah would. You Somebody else could make a motion to okay. amend. To amend. You want me to do that? Yes. I make a motion that we amend the language of the rules to change those two shalls to may as prior discussed. As discussed priorly. Terrific. Somebody Is second, there a second to that. I'll second that amendment. Council Penny Jordan. Any further discussion? I, just a quick question. Yes. Um, because we were strictly talking about the draft code of ethics tonight. Is it? Are we okay going ahead to amend? No, because it says town rules on the agenda as well. They're, they're both under. Okay. Uh, yeah, you you got you got ground cover. That's a great question, but we're yeah, it looks like we're covered. So thank you. But always great to check, for sure. Okay, any any other discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Great. For the amendment. And that's that's on the amendment. On You'll the need amendment. one on the original on oh, the uh, yeah. primary motion okay. too. All right. Thank Sorry. You. We're all set. <laughs> Do we have to vote? Now we vote on the motion as amended. amended. Motion as amended. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do I, uh, all those in favor of the original motion oh. as amended? Uh, one just brief discussion. Okay. Uh, uh, so just for people watching at home, um, understand because all of, because our dis discussions have all happened at a workshop, no one has any idea what the thinking was behind this, um, I imagine. So I guess my thought behind this at the end of the day is um, the rules as written, if you look at them as written, uh, they literally said we are not allowed to take any action that results in personal or financial gain to any third party. Um, so taken to the extreme as written, we can't offer tax abatements. We can't vote um, on anything that results in financial benefit to a third party. So it, at a minimum, that aspect needed to be fixed. Uh, at the same time, the conflict of interest examples that were iterated present a situation where it, in a small town like Cape Elizabeth, um, if you are familiar with people, basically you'd be barred from participating in discussions, um, which I don't, for me, when I look at these types of rules, the question I begin with is, what type of activity are we looking to police? And do the rules police that activity or do they police other activity that we're not me meaning to encompass? And as it was written with the examples, it seemed overly broad. Um, my driving motivation here is, not, in, not to in any way water these down, it's the, there will still be the disclosure, there will still be, uh, and in fact, if anything, we beefed up the disclosure by adding some shells. We, we, the elected officials, still have to tell you, the general public, any interests we have at play. Um, 
but if they are interests that we don't think and the rest of the council doesn't think rises to the point that it's going to unduly influence our decision such that we put others ahead of the town as a whole, then this is just meant to make the process work in a, a reasonable way. Rules that might work in a city of a million people don't work in a city or a town of 9,000 people. And the goal was to make these more manageable. Again, disclosure will always still be required with these changes. It's just where is the point of accountability? How do you hold us accountable if we violate them? And now, we can still vote, we can still hold ourselves accountable, but yet also you, because now there's, in my opinion, a little bit beefed up more disclosure um, because of the fact that there isn't this onerous, oh, I don't think I need to disclose because we have to every single time do this vote. Um, the goal is eventually there's more disclosure, and by having that disclosure and knowing that we are following the letter uh, of the rules, we're following the rules to the letter, people no longer say, hey, the le the rules say this, but you guys are operating this way. And there might be a good reason why the town council is operating this way, because things don't work if you're, we're following things to the letter. So we're making the rules more reasonable, more uh, usable in a way that hopefully then doesn't end up having people saying, hey, you're not following the letter of the rules. Something fishy is going on. Instead, it's the, no, it isn't necessarily something fishy. It's just these rules don't work. And if you take them to the extreme, it just causes everything to break down. So. Sorry for being so long-winded. Again, the goal is more disclosure. You guys can hold us accountable. We'll hold each other accountable to the best of our ability, but then you can hold us accountable at the ballot box. And there we go. Sorry for the long speech. Thank you. Any, anyone else have any comments? Yep, that, I think that these, these edits will uh, make it this a smoother process. Um, you know, the, the goal is, is to have people disclose, bring this up, and the council will always have the option of voting. We have not taken the option of voting away from ourselves. So um, anyway, any, anything else? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Item number 65, appointment of election clerks and warden. And now I will ask the town clerk to tee this up. And, uh, Members of the public? Um, I need to recuse myself because my sister is included in this uh, item as warden. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone who would like to speak to this issue? And I forgot to ask if anyone wanted to speak to the Code of Ethics issue. Sorry. Does anyone like to speak to this issue? Okay. All right. And so with the town clerk, uh, tell us a little bit about this. We, we do this on a yearly basis. We do. This is part of the election laws that uh, the municipal, municipal officers appoint election clerks no later than May 1st, actually of the even number of years, and that um, the approval of the municipal officers, the clerk shall appoint the warden and may appoint one or more deputies uh, to assist on election day as well. Um, as you all recall, in December, we lost our long-term uh, election um, warden election staff, uh, Sherry Gower. And um, I think if everybody knows Sherry, that she um, really enjoyed her work as a warden. She really believed in the process of elections and dem democracy, um, and she will be very hard to replace. Um, fortunately, uh, someone with very similar values as Sherry in that regard is Carol Ann Jordan. Carol Ann is a long-term election staff member as well, has been very important and vital to uh, the success of our elections uh, over the last number of years. Um, so it is with great pleasure that I would recommend that Carol Ann Jordan serve as warden, uh, Victoria Gilman, Megan Winker, and myself, Deborah Lane, to serve as deputy wardens. In addition, we have a list of residents who may be considered uh, for election clerks uh, for the next two years. Um, these are uh, folks that have worked elections before, some have not. And again, this just gives me the ability to reach from this list if I choose, or if I, if need be, I can go beyond the list as well. Um, we do have to have a balance uh, in elections between the major political parties and, and so forth. So depending on who is available to work and who is not, um, sometimes it's a challenge um, to get election staff. But 
I certainly appreciate these folks, uh, and I would recommend that their names be brought forward to be considered as election workers, uh, excuse me, election clerks um, as well. Thank you, Deb. Uh, I, Councilor Caitlin Jordan, just a disclosure. I'm also related to Carolyn Jordan, not as closely as related as Penny, and I'm also related to a few other people on these lists, but not immediate family members. Thank you. Uh, I would, before we proceed any further, I would like to thank our citizens for coming forth to participate in our political process. I think we are incredibly lucky to have the people with the caliber and integrity that we do volunteer and help Absolutely. us out. And I will say, with the advent of longer times available for absentee voting, this becomes is becoming arduous, it really is, because of the, the time uh, uh, needs. So I, I just want to say that to thank, to thank our folks for, for coming forward to participate in this. Um, so thank you for your recommendations. Uh, is there a motion to approve the recommendations of the town clerk for Carol Ann Jordan as warden and Victoria Gilman, Megan Winker, and Deborah Lane to serve as deputy wardens until successors are sworn? So moved. Is there a second? Councilor Lennon, any discussion? All those in favor? It's 6-0. And also, uh, is there a motion to approve the following list of residents who may be considered to serve as election clerks for the town of Cape Elizabeth for a period of two years and until successors are sworn? And I, w I won't read all the names, but for those of you at home, this is all, these are all in the meeting uh, support, supporting documents online. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Randall, any discussion? All those in favor? 6-0. Thank you very much. Item number 66 is the school budget validation referendum election warrant. Again, I will ask the town clerk to just introduce this item. Sure, do we happy. do this annually as well? Yes, we do. Um, the um, election laws do require that the municipal officers set uh, the warrant for the election. This would call for the school budget validation referendum on Tuesday, June 12th. Um, and again, there's just the one question on the school budget uh, and then the uh, non-binding expression of opinion for consideration if the council chooses uh, to include that too high, acceptable, too low number. The election will be held on Tuesday, June 12th at the high school gymnasium. Polls will be open at, from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m. Uh, absentee ballot processing will be held, uh, or processed, excuse me, on election day beginning at 7 a.m. Um, the Registrar of Voters is uh, available to accept new registrations and corrections to the voter list on election day uh, or at the town office prior to the election. I would just remind folks that uh, proof of identity and residency is required to register to vote if you uh, have your driver's license with your CAPE address, which most people should um, when they move into town, um, that would satisfy both. Uh, we've been getting a lot of calls regarding the election. Um, we have folks that want to enroll in political parties or change from one party to another. Uh, that information, Wendy Derzowick has done a great job of posting that information on the town's website. Uh, as soon as the sample ballot uh, is available, which will be May 15th after the council votes on the 14th. Um, that ballot will be available if folks want to look at that and we will also be posting the primary ballots um, in the state referendum election ballot as well. Thank you. Um, is, uh, first of all, is there a motion to approve the school budget validation referendum election warrant? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Penny Jordan. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. And second, is there a motion to approve the school budget questions for the school budget validation referendum? So moved. Councilor Caitlin Jordan, is it? Second, uh, then. Councilor Penny Jordan, second. Any discussion? All those in favor? It's approved. Unanimous. Great. Thank you. And thank you. Thank You're you, welcome. Madam. And thank you for our citizens at, home, citizens at home who will be participating again. Item number 67, Municipal Budget Guidance for Fiscal Year two, two, 2020. Uh, this again, um, I, I will own. I had uh, been reading about budget deliberations in our 
surrounding communities and something struck me about the city of Portland and that is that they, they have a meeting every March in which they start preliminary planning for the following year fiscal year's budget. And as you know, we've talked about this year giving our town manager some guidelines when he starts to create a budget as far as any percentage of salaries, raises, and so forth. Um, but I, I thought, you know, maybe we don't do that early enough. And so I, I ran it by our town manager who had some other thoughts on that concept. So because of what he was thinking and why he thought this would be valuable for the council to consider, we put it on <coughs> tonight's agenda. So I'll just ask Matt to say a few things about why perhaps having a, a meeting in March for the following fiscal year to set the guidelines or begin the dis guideline discussion, not to set them, but just to start that might be really valuable. So Matt, if you would. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to, I'll be brief. Uh, we're looking to do this possibly in, in June, June 5th. Uh, the thought being during the uh, conversations yeah. of the whole budget process was uh, two concepts that came up, finance director, human resources director. Those are both fairly significant paradigm shifts as well as the discussions that we, uh, the council and the school board may be entering into starting this week about the one town concept as idea. So uh, Considering that we normally start the budget right after the start of the year, it may be better to have those discussions as a, almost like a debriefing after the budget process is completed on the town and school side. So we can look at that and plan in advance how that would be done, how it would be paid for, who would that person be responsible for, or, or the, who would those people be responsible to and, and for. Getting up to that in June would be a good opportunity for me to know, okay, this is what that kind of structure would look like, and this is where I would have to work on the town side, at least to, to appropriately try to meet some of the areas that you'd like to see us address. And I, and I, I, I may have misspoke. I, I mentioned that Portland has this beginning meeting in March, but yeah, you know, my, Matt is recommending June. The other piece of this is that um, you know, he, will, he will know with our capital improvement plan also, what, what things are coming up and that in the cycle of our capital improvement plan, every year we have things that we, are, we plan to, to deal with. And so this would be a good opportunity to say, hey folks, the plan is for next year we, we do X, Y, Z. We need to consider all that in our budget process. Um, and as far as our, uh, you know, looking at these other positions, I mean, those are preliminary discussions, but, you know, my thought is better to start early than too late, so. Uh, Sarah was first, actually. I'm sorry, can you tell me the positions again? Oh, uh, we were, a couple of things came up during our budget deliberations, and it was a finance director and human resources. And they, they would be shared by the town and the school, or maybe, or that's what we're going to talk about? That would be part of the conversation. Well, yes. Yeah. And so one, one of the things that have come out of, and I know you were away and missed, missed a, meeting, a couple of meetings, or one anyway, uh, one of the, the thoughts that I actually broached at a workshop was perhaps given some of the difficulties and given our municipal audit results, <coughs> that maybe the time has come to consider an independent finance director, a CFO, a chief finance officer for the town to whom the school department and the municipal side would answer. Um, I, I don't have all, you know, we don't have that all ironed out, but my thought was, let's start the discussion. And how that would ultimately look, I don't know. But um, we are, the auditors told us, we are an outlier in the community and that we have a, a budget, a total budget of about $40 million and we don't have a dedicated finance director. And Yarmouth, for example, very comparable community, comparable total budget. They've got an independent finance director. Um, and so th this individual you know, is, is staff neutral and is responsible for all things financial. So I, it's, it's something to, you know, that we discussed that people seem to feel merited looking into further. And I just have one suggestion, given how many workshops we're <laughs> teeing up, you know, we could do more than one thing in each workshop. Fair enough. Oh, sure. so. You do this, yeah, and yeah. Then, yeah. We'll, 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 you know, whatever, you can pile yeah. on to it. <laughs> just so we can get through it all. It's a snow day. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, that's, that was the thought behind this item. So anyway, uh, Penny. 
Councilor Patty George? Um, number one, I think it's a really good idea because things are fresh in one's head at that point in time. What I would ask is that I, I see that, uh, you know, we're looking out to 2020 and that within that process, it would maybe look at our uh, um, fire department and that fits right in with this long range, well, mid range planning. And so I would suggest that we throw that in there also. Agreed. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thanks. Um, <laughs> I support and encourage this. I, I would push for a later date in June or even, I, I can't remember if we have a workshop scheduled in July. I know that there's one month that we take off nope. on the workshop front. So, um, The reason being, I think that we should, uh, and I know that this would be just the first part of ongoing discussions. This is just a kickoff, but I think it would be very helpful um, to hold it after the school budget referendum. Mm -hmm. um, specifically for the reason, even though this is dealing more with the municipal side of the budget, um, is currently being formed the, uh, and, and I believe what's going to the school board vote tomorrow, includes a portion of the architect and engineering fees for the proposed renovations. Um, and so I think that that is a, a worthwhile component to know about from the ballot referendum results prior to engaging in this discussion. It's a good idea. Great idea. So whether that's a separate June workshop later in the month or what, I don't know, but <laughs> I don't think I, I, I would strongly advocate for not doing it before the referendum. Well, I think that's a great point. Um, everybody in agreement yeah. with that? All right. And so uh, could I have a motion to refer this uh, recommendation to a June workshop? to be held after the school validation vote on June 12th. Councillor Straw, in a second. Councillor Caitlin Jordan, any more discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous, thank you. Okay, item number 68, our final item, the board and committee goals. We have received from the conservation committee their goals for the year um, and um, I think they're quite impressive. There's no one here from the Conservation Committee tonight, but um, they do some wonderful and outstanding work, and I think they have sent us some very uh, clearly defined and um, meaningful goals. So, yeah. I, I just had one other update. That it was a council request that all the uh, different committees re uh, provide you with their goals for the upcoming year. Uh, they also ran into some challenges with the weather. Uh, so in anticipate on next month's agenda, we will be receiving, the council will be receiving uh, Fort Williams Park Committee's goals, as well as the library, uh, okay. library's goals as well. Those are the two outstanding ones that we have. And uh, I received, uh, received them from the librarian on Friday, uh, but it was after we had posted, so I didn't feel it would be appropriate to bring it up at this point in time. So we, I let them know that we would put it on the next agenda. And, the council would be able to review that at that point. And so we'll have, have those then, and then that should wrap up everybody who has goals for the year outside of you know, the non-goal-oriented groups like the planning board, zoning board of appeals, right. your, your quasi-judicial boards. Mm -hmm. So uh, they were exempted, but right. we should be wrapped up after that. Well, thank you, and uh, do I have a motion to uh, acknowledge receipt of the Constitution Committee's 2018 Goals and Objectives? So moved. So Councilor Lennon, Councilor Randall second. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Thank you very much, Conservation Committee. Uh, citizens at this point in the meeting may raise any topic that is not on the agenda that pertains to Cape Elizabeth local government. I see one citizen in the audience. She does not wish to speak. Thank you. <laughs> Could I? I can tell you that I want to start work at my company. <laughs> 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 I, Congratulations. <laughs> Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. And a second? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Here's the signatures in the board.